Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And apologizing, we had some audio issue at the beginning and that should be resolved right now. Welcome to DevSecOps Days 2021 LA event. It was, we were planning to have an in-person event, but apparently because of the COVID, we switched to the a virtual event. And I was hoping to go to LA, get a nice weather out there, but unfortunately I'm in the Pittsburgh side, still running the virtually here but I wish we can get together in person to have the DevSecOps Days event over there. With that said, let's talk about the, what is the really DevSecOps Days and how we are important while we are getting together. So a little bit background about the DevSecOps Days community event. As we are getting together as a DevOps community and we realize that we're not really sharing so much security in terms of the DevOps principles. And one of the common principles is really discussing the problems or solution or some scenarios, then we can share through the community event like DevSecOps Days. Because we strongly believe that DevOps is based on the uh, collaboration. It's not just the same team, it's a community. So as a community, we can help each other. As a community, we can share our knowledge, our experience and how we are doing well. And then we can help others instead of failing and we fail times because we can learn the failure from a community perspective. That's what the devsecopsdays.com has established. And as a common, kind of like a common platform, we get the folks from the speakers or the participants, they can share their stories and their knowledge. This is one of the events and we have the many other events throughout the year. So today we're just gonna share our experience as I said. So how are we gonna really work around today? And if you have any questions, please go to the YouTube channel and ask the question over there. We have been monitoring the question and then as to the live participants and to the speakers as well. As I said, it's about the sharing and, and talking. And in the meantime, if you have any uh, question as well that you would like to continue, you can reach out to us at info at sci.cm.edu or you can reach out to me as well. We are happy to communicate. We're happy to and address your problem. Maybe you have some feedback you would like to share with the community because this is not a one way you're asking. I would like to really hear your story as well. So, Let's talk about what are we gonna talk about today. And today we're gonna to cover up a really broad speakers, broad contents in the DevSecOps concept. We're gonna start from the infrastructure perspective and talking about you know, how we are gonna improve security posture in our workflow. And Chris is really gonna talk about that. And after we're gonna dive into the a policy perspective and how the policy will be established through the echo environment. A lot of problem that we have been hearing in the community I know we are doing very well, probably addressing security, but we have so much dependencies we rely on. We're gonna discuss and talk about, and also have a shared story about uh, how the complaints gonna work, what the policies are, and how we can manage the secret and the Kubernetes, which is another uh, problem that we may hear a lot, because when we start to use more DevOps tools, more automation, of course, adversary will take an advantage of it. So we're gonna hear that, how can we smart way to use the some dependence on some problems, some issues in an environment. Then we will move into the technical discussion about the service mesh concept related to the Kubernetes and container, how it's gonna work out in a big scale and what we should do with respect to security. Then we will continue for the product perspective security as, as uh, the first half of the day. And then we're gonna continue second half of the day with the keynote speakers and Tanya, and she will join us as a live and she's gonna talk about as the, it is more than a pipeline. I know we're setting up a pipeline, it's very easy stuff, but when we get into the more detail, it's actually beyond that, which we're gonna cover up today. And having your tools is perfect, you have it, but we need to cover what we should do, what the principles are, what the components are with respect, with respect to security. So Tanya will cover up all this concept as the keynote speakers. Then we're gonna continue rest of the afternoon and talk about the metrics pieces. That's gonna be how we're gonna measure our success and relate with the security. There is always a question, what is enough for security that we will get understanding how, what is the balance of security findings? How can we measure our security postures with respect to the work? So we'll continue with the metrics and we're gonna finish up the day with a continuous compliance perspective. And if you're an organization that you would like to comply with the compliances, maybe HIPAA, maybe SOAX, what are the problems we may see in it? What is the solution to be a constant, to be a constant, to constantly be compliant on organization the are in? So Arun is gonna talk about it. We're gonna finish up the day about uh, 3 p.m. and uh, 
the rest of the LA time. So that's kind of our today that we will continue. And a little bit background myself, I have been a technical manager, technical director at SCI and managing the group of the, as the group of focusing on DevSecOps and Agile. And also I have been focusing and, and teaching as well DevOps and since 2015 at the CMU. And also I'm teaching a software security class as well. It's a growing interest and it's a growing interest. It's kind of a solution with the community perspective I have been teaching. A little bit about the Tanya's background. I know we're going to talk about the, the keynote speaker as well, but I would like a little bit brief about the Tanya's background. And Tanya, and she is the creator of the SheHex Purple organization, and she is the best-selling author about Alice and uh, Alice and Bob and learning application secret, which is kind of like a one-on-one thing for security. And she's a constant speaker, and she's a community provider, community supporters with respect to FSECOPS and AppSec engineers and work that she has been the tremendous work and we're gonna take an advantage of in hearing her today at the lunchtime. With that said, we have many other speakers as well and, and we're gonna get everybody's bios and the, their background, their speaking slot when they get into the specific topics. And also I would like to thank our moderators and our moderator Jeff and David will be organizing our event as the team together and they will moderating the sessions and between the speakers and then questions and et cetera. So as I said at the beginning, and we have many DevSecOps Days events all around the world. So I know if you go to DevSecOpsDays.com, you may see the previous event like a Boston or the Pittsburgh event. And also we have other events as well. The Toronto event happened this year too. So we are expanding our DevSecOps Day all around the world. And today we have an LA event, but and we have an event sometimes in the Melbourne. We haven't got this date yet as settled on and from the Australia. So we have another one in September 7th is coming up short in Rockies. So we have a Tokyo event, we have a DC, and then a couple other events. We haven't finalized the date yet, but probably will be in, in the Europe side and also the Tokyo, as we said. So we have many other events that we are getting together. And other things for, as a community supporter, if you would like to host the event in your city, in your community, let us know. And we are happy to help you to establish that community interest group in your environment in your organization with respect to the city or, or a group of people and happy to support you because this is a growing interest and we would like to make sure that we're able to reach out to the practitioner perspective that we can share our knowledge. On top of that, and I would like to advertise as well, and we have been a sponsor and organizer all day DevOps and that will be happening October 28, which is a longer event. So DevSecOps Day is about uh, you know six to seven hours total the maximum but all day DevOps is about 24 hours, literally 24 hours and starting early in the morning at goes to the next day. And we have all around this, the world as a speakers and participants, which is free again. If you look at the more exposed to the more speakers as a live sessions and talk with the speakers and share more knowledge, I really encourage you to go onto the alldaydevops.com and register that. With that said, as an SCI, and we have been organizing many other DevOps events as well through the blog posts or webinars or webcasts and then and website information. If you have a further information you would like to understand or learn or sharing, please reach out our website and look at that information or sharing information with us as well. And also I would like to thank our sponsor. This is a community event as the CMU are sponsoring and Sonotype and also Purple Hack, our community sponsors that helping us to achieve this event. That said, and if you have any questions, please reach out to me and from my email address is up there, or you can reach out to me the LinkedIn or, or Twitter handle. So whatever is it for you, please reach out to us for any question I can answer it or we can discuss together as a team. That said, I would like to introduce our next speaker. Next speaker will be Christopher Wondermate. And Christopher has a great background with respect to the cybersecurity and also the and also the, the, with respect to the uh, uh, specific implementation of the security perspective. So Christopher, and he's from Netherlands, and he is a Dutch and American nationality. And Christopher studied at the University of Amsterdam, majoring the neuroscience with a computer science minor. He achieved his master's in information science and joined Cisco and through the graduate program. So since then, and he is acting as a security engineers in the Dutch market, as well as and he's helping to the uh, consulting services as well and helping the organization establish security practices. So with that said, I would like to hand over to Christopher, then he can talk about uh, the, his topics and specifically for the 
uh, workflow perspective, how can we counter threat? How can we find the security vulnerabilities? What things are we can cover up our DevSecOps environment? And Christopher, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Hassan, um, um, for that uh, great introduction. Um, and uh, that's perfect. You actually covered my uh, my first slide already, so uh, we we can skip that uh, that slide uh, uh, now. So that will save some time. Um, so hi everyone uh, again, Christopher van der Mara. I'm joining here from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. So very happy and honored to uh, be the first speaker um, after uh, Hassan. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you about um, automating your threat hunting workflows. And it might be a little bit of a different session uh, compared to some other uh, sessions that we have out here, um, uh, but uh, that makes it just uh, even more interesting. Um, and it's really about uh, automating some of your security operations specifically. Um, so um, yeah, uh, welcome everyone again. Um, by the way, I'm from Cisco. Uh, people might know Cisco from uh, networking, router switching, we also do a lot of security, uh, and I am a developer advocate uh, for our uh, security portfolio. Um, and uh, yeah, let's kick it off. Um, so to start, I wanted to show you this picture. I, I show this picture quite often. Uh, it's a picture of, and I always ask, like, what, how do you feel when you see this picture? Um, it's it's uh, my story today. It's like the feeling where you have to drink from a fire hose. Uh, there's just too much information out there. And this is basically the premise of my presentation today. Um, at the end, I will repeat this statement that there's simply too much information and threat intelligence out there for security operations center analysts to consciously consume, unless you maybe live for t uh, tens of thousands of years. So since we can't humanly and consciously consume this information, we need to automate this and we need to use our friends uh, uh, computers uh, and uh, and scripts to uh, to solve this um, and in the end what we can achieve out of this are bite-sized cases or incidents that we can offer our security analysts so that they can make sure that all of our applications are running smoothly um, so my agenda for today is the following. Um, I will first do an introduction into threat hunting. I'll spend a bit of time on this because I think it's quite interesting. Uh, we are here at a DevSecOps event. Um, we have the word sec, uh, so everyone should be uh, aware of what threat hunting is and how you can use it in your own organization or for your own research. Um, I will then talk a bit about uh, uh, SecureX. Um, so big disclaimer, I'm also going to mention a couple of other non-Cisco products that you can use instead. I don't wanna do a product pitch here. I'm just using it as an example. And then I'm going to show you two use cases of how you can actually automate some threat hunting. One will be from Twitter, where I'm actually going to ingest Twitter posts to find threat intelligence. The other one is going to be from blog posts via RSS feeds, where I'm going to harvest threat intelligence out of. And when you harvest that threat intel, we can do some cool stuff with it uh, that saves a lot of time. Uh, finally, we'll have a conclusion. And obviously, you can ask your questions uh, via the YouTube channel um, or other methods that have been announced. And I'm happy to answer them uh, for you. So first off is threat hunting. So you might ask yourself, what is threat hunting? Um, it might be, we probably have a very broad audience here today. We might have some diehard security folks. If I'm going to ask each and, each and every one of them what threat hunting is, I will get as much answers, different types of answers as I ask uh, the, uh, the amount of people. Um, for people that are new to security and are maybe more um, familiar with uh, more application development, uh, this intro is also for you. Now, you might think yourself hunting um, that it has to do with uh, going into the woods, uh, being unrecognizable, even though he's uh, this person is wearing a lot of orange, and uh, yeah, shooting uh, 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 things. Well, that's not completely true. Um, there uh, is definitely resemblance. 
But threat hunting is, according to Wikipedia, the process of proactively and iteratively, which is important here, the iterate, iterative part. And for programmers, you probably uh, see this as a loop immediately. But you go and search through networks and, and through your, your infrastructure, and you go and search uh, and to detect and isolate advanced threats that evaded your existing security solutions. So obviously you have all kinds of preventive security solutions, protecting your applications, protecting maybe your users, protecting your, your endpoints, servers, uh, um, uh, clusters, etc. But as we all know, those security solutions will be evaded at some point in time. So the, 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 the trick with threat hunting is you go and search for these um, uh, evaded um, attacks. Um, there are different types of hunts that you can do. You can do intelligence-driven hunts, and these are usually low-hanging fruits. Um, and what I mean with that is these are usually quite simple to do, um, but they can be very powerful. Um, uh, and you're, you're basically going and looking for known threats, but very fresh threats. So what I mean with this is there is a brand new threat. So it might have bypassed your security solutions yesterday, but you want to go and search for them today. You also have more TTP driven, um, uh, hunts and the TTP stands for tactics, techniques, and procedures. And uh, this is really more of a behavioral search. Finally, you also have uh, anomaly driven uh, searches. So this is really where you go and look for low prevalence artifacts and really um, yeah, try to find uh, outliers or anomalies and to see whether they are uh, threats or not. So whether they're malicious or benign. Today, I'm going to talk to you about uh, intelligence driven hunts. And the reason why it will be um, more clear in a little bit. So um, there is a uh, so-called threat hunting loop. And this threat hunting loop uh, is a framework um, that has been created. And basically the idea is that it's an iterative process to, to look for threats. So uh, you creating, usually you start with creating an hypothesis, um, for example, I believe that my uh, organization or my application is compromised with this new type of attack or vulnerability that has just been discovered. So you then go and investigate this. You might find new patterns, but these patterns, you want to enrich them. So what you want to do is you, you might find something that, uh, that you, that you want to look for. So what you're going to do is, uh, enrich this with threat intelligence and threat intelligence can be information from all over the world um, and to see whether your hypothesis is actually true or not. So did you indeed uncover an attack? Um, now this part specifically uh, can be automated quite uh, quickly and that is because uh, the other parts of this hunting loop require, well, as I mentioned, it, actual human uh, cognition, whereas this part is usually just cross-referencing information uh, and enriching it. Um, so this is where we can play a role with automation. Um, now, uh, what we have here is um, a level of maturity of uh, organization into threat hunting. And you can see here all the way at level zero that it relies primarily on automated learning. So that is usually, I don't know, some kind of preventive security tool that says, hey, I recognize a known threat. Whereas if you look all the way on the top of this, uh, this maturity uh, model, you can see that le the leading organizations that are able to do threat hunting are automating the majority of successful data analysis procedures. Um, so what you see here is that you can go from zero to hero quite easily if you're able to automate uh, a lot of your um, data analysis procedures. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples of that today. Now there's two types of threat hunting. You can do it on demand, and that's more of a reactive, like, hey, I see something, 
going to search more for it. But what you can also do is basically automate it uh, continuously uh, hunt. And uh, that I'm going to show you as well. Uh, today is the right part uh, here on the screen is a what can you do to sort of alleviate stress on your security team so that they can focus on things that actually matter and do a lot of that data analysis um, automatically. Um, uh, so here what we have is a pyramid of pain um, and you can scan that QR code if you want, you will get uh, come to the article. Um, and uh, this is an, another interesting uh, thing uh, where you again see that tools and TTPs uh, at the top of this pyramid, which this is uh, the pain that you can do to a hacker. So if you dis discover and block hash values, IP addresses, domain names or networks for, from a hacker, that is yeah, trivial to annoying. Uh, everyone that knows how hash algorithms work know that if you change a small thing in a malware file, for example, then it will have a complete new hash value. So if you block a hash value, the, the hacker doesn't really care. And usually the hacker has malware that has a different hash value every time. So so-called polymorphic malware. So it doesn't really matter. Um, the top part is going to be really annoying. If you exactly know the tools and the techniques, etc., that the hacker is using, then sometimes it's game over. But we're going to ignore this top part uh, of today. And what we want to focus on is all of these below parts. They're up to annoying and they're actually easy to automate. So there are feeds that you can, uh, tap into, or there are places where you can harvest fresh IOCs or indicators of compromise uh, that you are able to use uh, to uh, in threat hunting. Um, and those top pieces of this pyramid, we leave to the humans. So to our actual analysts, like, hey, we think we have discovered something. Can you please check this out? Um, now, obviously, this is the idea. Uh, we start from hundreds of thousands to hundreds to tens. In the end, we only want to leave a couple of incidents left um, for uh, actual human intervention. Um, and the trick what we're going to do today is we're going to combine local context with global intelligence. We're going to cross-reference that. We're going to create actionable insights. And the local context here um, can be anything. So it can be endpoint logs, it can be Kubernetes audit logs, flow data, flow data can come from cloud environments or local environments. It can be all kinds of information. And we're going to cross-reference that with uh, our global intelligence feeds. And as you can see here, there's all kinds of feeds that we have or reports, but there's also global intelligence that you can gather from, for example, blog posts or Twitter. Um, now, today I'm going to show you a couple of Python scripts and I'll do a demo in a, in a, in a little bit of one of those um, scripts. And I'm going to combine that with a tool called SecureX, which is a, a free tool from Cisco uh, that you can use to combine all forms of data, threat uh, intelligence data. It can be local or uh, global, and it's based on uh, the sticks. Um, uh, data model to basically uh, model all of this threat intel in a common data model so that you can easily cross-reference it. Now, as I mentioned, this is not a pitch or anything for this SecureX tool. I'm just using it because it's at my disposal as a, as a Cisco employee, um, but uh, it's definitely not uh, some, some marketing that I'm doing today. Um, so, but I do want to quickly introduce it um, the, the thing with uh, the SecureX tool is that it can combine all kinds of information. So on the left, you see third-party data, and on the right, you see Cisco data. Uh, you gather that context and in intelligence, so local context and global intelligence. And in the middle there, we can actually uh, cross-reference that and take actions based on it. So again, we can take in all forms of data. This is not closed or whatever, uh, and it sort of looks like this. So in the end, uh, SecureX is an API aggregator 
so to speak. So it works based on uh, APIs to gather all of that global and local data and then to take actions on it. Um, there are obviously all kinds of other uh, alternatives, uh, both open source as well as paid solutions um, that are uh, similar to SecureX. I listed a couple of them here uh, just so to be uh, um, as transparent as possible here. Um, all right, so now let's go into my first uh, demo for today, uh, which is ingesting data from Twitter. And um, again, what I mentioned is threat hunting is all about, um, uh, and especially uh, intelligence driven threat hunting is all about gathering information and cross-referencing that with your local, uh, local data. And that local data can be uh, all kinds of logging uh, that you have. And you basically want to check, hey, this bad thing that I saw here on the internet, is that somewhere in my environment? As that been seen in my Kubernetes cluster, someone uh, reaching out to my uh, my API service um, or or to my web server, um, um, am I infected? That's basically what you want to know. Is my environment compromised? Now, um, as I mentioned, you have all kinds of feeds that you can use with this, but I'm basically I want to talk about how you can be a little bit more creative uh, in this. So uh, I, I'm wondering here who in the audience knows this hashtag, uh, hashtag open there, um, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, this is a hashtag used by a lot of ethical hackers uh, when they share um, information on new fresh malware. For example, uh, this is, as you can see here, the hashtag open there. You can search on Twitter for this if you, if you want. And you can see that people are sharing links, IP addresses, sometimes file hashes or, or other artifacts or indicators of compromise or IOCs as, uh, for short, um, that uh, are involved with a new attack that they found. Now, this is very valuable information. However, you can't really find this in a security tool uh, quite easily. So what, uh, what I thought like, like is, well, I as an analyst would be super interested in this information, but I don't even have time to stay up to date with my own social media and Twitter feed. How the hell should I then follow hashtag open there and all kinds of other hashtags or blogs or all kinds of information that is out there to, um, to do threat hunting. So I was like, well, let's start automating this. So uh, this is a, a tweet I once did. Um, there is uh, on my GitHub, you can find uh, this script if you're interested. Um, if you have cool ideas, feel free to, uh, to do pull requests here as well or, or open an issue if you find anything. Um, but basically I'm going to skip through this a little bit quicker due to uh, the time. Um, but basically the idea here is that um, we're going, for, we're checking every day. Are there any new tweets that are using hashtag open there? We're using the Twitter API for that. Uh, and if there are any new uh, tweets, um, we're going to search for indicators of compromise. So for domain names, IP addresses, file hashes, or any kind of artifacts that we may want to search for. Um, and we're then going to actually use SecureX, as I mentioned earlier, to cross-reference this with our logging. And in SecureX, we can put in all types of uh, logging data um, and we can actually see, do we have any targets or, or uh, devices or, or, or uh, containers or whatever that actually interacted with one of these artifacts? Um, if that happens, I'm going to create a case in casebook and send a, a, a chat message as well with this information. And this is where the trick is basically, we are not uh, asking the analysts to manually go through these tweets and to check whether uh, there's an infection or not. We're only going to uh, notify them if something bad is going on. And, uh, and then your hypothesis, as we saw earlier in the beginning, um, will then be probably true 
you have been infected with some kind of new type of attack. So enough talking, let's go into switch to my demo. Um, as you can see here, we have the hashtag open there. Um, and uh, yeah, there's all kinds of information. I can manually copy paste this. This is what it will probably take to manually do this. You copy paste this information and you need to do that for all of these uh, blog posts. So you can use a tool like SecureX Threat Response to then uh, parse that uh, tweet and to then uh, check whether uh, you have uh, devices or, or uh, applications, uh, containers uh, in your environment that have been affected with this. So in this case, you can see um, uh, what that would manually look like. It looks like quite a lot of work if you need to do this for a lot of different tweets. Um, but luckily, there's a Twitter API. Um, and I would definitely recommend applying for a developer account on uh, Twitter. Um, and you can use, for example, uh, um, this search um, API to look for the most recent tweets. And you can use that since ID to then check whether you're not parsing the same tweet twice. Now, I'm using the Threat Response Python API uh, module um, to actually do all of this stuff um, in an automated way, as you can see here. Uh, so I have a simple config file here. Um, I know this is not the most secure way of doing it, but it's just uh, pure for uh, sample. Um, what I'm doing is I'm parsing that tweet uh, for observables and using regular expressions for that. Um, and then checking whether there are sightings. And sightings means, has this been seen somewhere in my environment? If so, I'm creating a case in Casebook and giving it a high priority sort of tag in the title um, that um, something bad is going on. And I'm creating that case. And um, yeah, here basically I have my main script where I'm using that since ID, which I'm storing so that every day or every hour when I run the script, I'm not going to parse the same tweet twice. So uh, that is uh, quite cool uh, that that is possible. If there are no new tweets, I'm going to do nothing. Um, so this is uh, what it would uh, look like if I run the uh, script. And as you can see here, um, yeah, basically it's going to uh, parse the tweets one by one and check uh, whether something uh, interesting has happened. You can see here um, that my chat uh, message comes in and you can see here as well um, that I have these cases coming in here as well. And again, this can be any tool out there. The main thing I'm trying to tell you today is I want you to be creative in where you find your threat intelligence. Um, and that can be threat feeds, but also be a bit more creative and go and look for Twitter or blog posts that are of interest of you, uh, for you. And as you can see here, we have a high priority one. And if we open up this case here, you can actually see um, that if I were to investigate this, that I actually have targets. Um, so uh, in my organization that have come into contact with this. Um, so that's uh, basically the, the, the demo here today. Um, again, please, uh, so far, uh, be creative in where you find your threat intel. And we can do the same thing for blog posts. Um, I'm going to um, not do a demo for this today. Um, if you go on my um, GitHub, there is actually a YouTube video where you can see a blog post for this as well. Uh, the, the idea here is there are many threat intelligence agencies out there like Talos, uh, but also FortiGuard or Unit42, or there's also a lot of other blogs out there and they all have RSS feeds where you can actually go and parse these blog posts and look for indicators of compromise. And again, then cross-referencing that with your local uh, logging data. And this is just uh, an easy way of automating your threat hunting. So again, the same question here as on Twitter, go uh, on my GitHub if you're interested into learning more on this. Um, so to conclude, um, my question is, is this easier than manually searching Twitter and manually 
cross-referencing this with all of your different logging solutions? I think the answer is uh, quite easy on that one. Uh, yes, it is. It's quite easy to do this um, uh, because you just turn on the script, you uh, have a cron job, it runs every couple of hours, and you only get notified if something is actually worth your time. Um, and that is threat hunting in an automated way. Um, so um, that is uh, basically my conclusion here for, uh, today. Please don't see threat hunting as an on-demand task. See it as a continuous process, which you should include in your, uh, your whole DevOps pipeline. Um, so um, it's, it's uh, super easy to do it if you automate it. So that is the end of my session today. I hope that this uh, statement uh, makes a bit more sense on how much information is out there. Um, I really, again, uh, enjoyed talking to you today. If there are any questions out there in the q and I'm happy to answer uh, them now. Uh, Chris, thank you so much. A great presentation that you present with your demo. Uh, I have a couple you. of questions. I have a couple of questions, Chris. And you said a couple of words that was really, really interesting because we would like to be more proactive, not that reactive. That's what the DevSecOps it is. We would like to be more proactive and really we would like to shift the security to the left as much as we can in the level of the uh, developer perspective. I'm sure you heard about the upcoming OWASP top 10 as an example, OWASP top 10 got changed. Now this mm -hmm. year we are talking about the security by design. So when you look at, when I look at your uh, threat hunting perspective, like by knowing what is the uh, issues and what are the current problem out, out there? Any advice for our listeners? How can we use that knowledge in security design or application security development lifecycle perspective? Any tips that you can give our audience? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And um, yeah, I definitely agree that we should be as proactive as possible. So security by design, in my opinion, means a lot like thinking ahead what could an attacker do in my application uh, that is malicious thinking about that in advance and designing um, your application to basically uh, counteract that is in my opinion very important uh, what you can also do is you can create hypothesis um, based on for example the new OWASP top 10 and say like all right if my if this attack is used, how would I be able to recognize that that is happening? And how am I, and preferably in an automated way, how am I able to automatically detect these types of attacks? Now, obviously there's a lot of solutions out there that do this automatically and use the OWASP top 10, but every application is different. So you could think uh, ahead, how would this affect my application? and what indicators are out there that I need to look for to detect such an attack. Now, if you have that mindset, then I think you're on the right track to become more proactive and not reactive. So I'm assuming that we can use that knowledge and creating more security testing or more analyzing the any finding for our applications. It's a great word because every application is different and every mm -hmm. application has a different risk posture as well. So we would like to define what matter to us? What is the level of testing and integration or the, or the working through DevSecOps environment? Great, and I, we have one more question while we're wrapping up your session. And the question yeah. is about the uh, SecureX. You said it yes. is open, it's available for free, right? So our audience are asking like, is it free to use? If not, what are the other options as open source tools we can use as hunting the threat into our DevSecOps perspective? Do you want to share? Yeah, great question. So, so it is free indeed. So um, that being said, uh, I, I do think it really becomes valuable when you have uh, a couple of paid solutions uh, from Cisco. But if you go to security.cisco.com, I think uh, you can actually create an account for free. Um, you can also go to GitHub. Um, there's a Cisco security GitHub that has a lot of open source stuff. So a lot of the power behind SecureX is all open source, so you can find it on GitHub. Uh, there are uh, true open source projects as well 
For example, one is, I think the Hive is open source, which is very interesting to look at as well, uh, which allows you to combine all types of sources of information. Uh, and of course, if you're looking more into storing the logs, you can also look at Elastic, uh, Elastic Search. They also have a lot of uh, ways uh, of doing that in an open source uh, manner. And la last question, I'm assuming that your GitHub space has the Python code that you just presented to us. Is yes. that available yeah. as well? Great. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so github.com slash uh, Or Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Chris. And uh, we would Thank like you. to have you to continue our uh, QA session through the YouTube so while we are switching other speakers. Thank you so much for participating us and thanks for sharing your insightful information. Good luck to have the future events. Thank you so much. Thank so you. As, yep, and as we are going to the uh, next speakers, uh, next speakers will be uh, Marut Hamaran. And Marut is going to talk about really and in talking into the, and specifically, how can we have a policy as a code uh, through open policy agent? That is interesting topic. So Madhuran, he recorded his session. We're going to have it. And also, he's going to be available as the live Q&A session. So Murad Hamaran, he's a secret expert. And he is very hands-on practitioner, practitioner DevSecOps perspective. He's hands-on person. He's an instructor. And he's also advising and helping an organization as well. On top of his secret experience, he is holding a various certification as well. Like he has a certified Azure certified engineer, secret engineer, and he's a Microsoft certified trainer. And he was a lead author from ISO 27 and 7701, which is 001, which is the highest secret standard from ISO. So he is the lead author of that standards. He's a Scrum master and he's a certified DevSecOps professional as well. So we're going to have his session shortly and we'll continue his recording.
All right, welcome everybody to today's talk about implementing policy as code through Open Policy Agent. Thanks for tuning in today. My name is Maruda Madren. I go to Shakeran. I go by Modern and Short. I'm a principal consultant at Practical DevSecOps. I've been on the development side of things, worked with a lot of IT folks. I've been an agile coach, a DevOps and DevSecOps consultants for many organizations. I've authored a few courses at Florida site. Also created and maintained the OWASP ZAP uh, .NET API. Uh, there's plenty of other credentials out there, but I'm gonna skip that and get right to the subject of today. So the idea of today's talk is to explore the concept of policy as code through an example and probably convince you why you should consider policy as code for your applications. And when you do, what are the steps that it takes to actually integrate policy as code with any technology stack that you might be working with? And particularly deep dive into what it takes to write policies as code in this particular language called Rego, as it is called by the developers of the Open Policy Agent. Open Policy Agent is a solution that helps you implement policy as code. And then we'll wrap it up with uh, some resources to get you started. Uh, how about a demonstration first? Now, I'd like to see things before doing a lot of talking. So uh, what I would like to do now is to show you one simple use case of applying policy as code through Open Policy Agent. And here's how our demo setup for today looks like. So there is a front-end application that is built in Python. And this front-end application is protected by authentication. So uh, it uses Azure AD as an identity provider. And once it receives an access token and an ID token, the front-end application is going to call the back-end car management APIs. And before it actually calls the car management API, the front end, while it invokes the car management API, which is the back end, again, written in Python Flask, the back end APIs is going to query our policy as code solution, open policy agent. So when the front end calls the back end, right in the middle, there's our policy as code solution, open policy agent, which is going to interface with that call and parse the access tokens and the ID tokens that are coming through to the backend server, identify whether this call could be authorized or not. Now, this is a web application sample that uh, pretty much everybody can understand. So we picked this as a solution, but the concept of open policy, the, the concept of policy as code and open policy agent goes way beyond just web applications itself. And we'll discuss some of the use cases in the upcoming slides. So for now, uh, getting into this demonstration, I'm going to exit Keynote, take you to our lab portal. So this is our practical DevSecOps training and lab portal. The first two steps here talks about deploying the front-end application and the back-end application. I've already gone ahead and done that. So what we're going to do now is download the open policy agent binary. And once we've downloaded that, we're going to give it executable permissions. And then we're already in this directory. And let me show you what's inside that directory. So there's this particular file, among all the other files that encompasses this little API backend. There's this API odc.rego file. That's of particular interest today. We'll delve into that file. But before we do that, let's just run the open policy agent. And we will instruct open policy agent to use that API odz.rego file and listen on the address 8000. So that OPA listened successfully. With that, what we're gonna do, here's our front-end application. When I hit sign in, this front-end application is go gonna wanna authenticate itself to Azure AD. So the call is gonna go to Azure AD. And once it goes to Azure AD, there's an ID token and an access token that gets returned. It's all here. So for debugging and demonstration purposes, those tokens are printed right out here in the screen. So what we're gonna do now is as this user, Mizba, who happens to be a regular user, she's not a car manager, so she cannot upload cars into the system using the backend APIs yet. So let's see if she's able to get cars. 
So using the method get under the URL path, get cars, well, she's able to get cars. There's a success 200 okay message and there's a JSON response. So when Mizba tries to put cars uh, with some car ID, let's say, call it test car, and then we'll try and copy this sample data here that would allow us to create cars easily. And when we invoke that, Amisba is not allowed to put cars into the system anymore. Now, imagine that this application was in beta phases and only car managers were supposed to upload cars, but the application went live. So the organization changed its authorization policy to allow anybody that has access in the system to be able to upload cars. So how are we gonna achieve that? And normally, this goes through some sort of documentation. A lot of different security departments would get involved. Uh, they would assess the risks of doing this action of allowing everybody who has an account in the system to be able to upload cars into the system. And it will go through some sort of threat modeling. Documentations would need to be updated. Your web application firewall policies need to be updated. There's so many things that goes on behind the scenes. Finally, a developer would go to the Python Flask backend application and would have to change the authorization code to allow Mizba Siam, who's an everyone user, to be able to allow cars. Now, what we're gonna do in this case, I'm gonna take you back to the demonstrator. I'm gonna leave this front end application as is for now, take you back to this portal. I'm gonna do Control C on the system, so OPA is not running on this lab environment anymore. Clear this environment and show you, and show you that API odd Z file that I showed you a little bit ago. So this is the policy as code file that works behind the scenes and authorizing users and allowing them to perform certain actions. In this case, to be able to query cars, put cars, and so on. And as you see, you know, there's some code right here that allows you to parse the JOT token, the access token, and the ID token. We'll get to that in a little bit, but for now. Let's go down to the section that says, everyone can list cars. So let's get into that section. Uh, hit I for insert on VI. We'll try and add a new allow rule. And then we'll say, as long as the input method is put, and if the path of the input is cars and some car ID, and some ID there representing the ID of that particular car. And as long as the user is authenticated, I don't want to particularly check whether they're a manager or not yet, because now the organization policy says every user in the system should be able to put cars into that system. Now, let's save that file, exit out of the text editor, and we'll go back and run OPA again. We have not touched the front end code or the back end code, the Python code that actually supposedly should be implementing the authorization logic. And generally in applications, that's how things are written. But in this case, we have decoupled our policy decisions as code in this particular file called API .rego. So let's go run OPA again. And without rebuilding, redeploying the application, if I just hit invoke, would Mizba be able to put cars? Well, if everything was set up correctly, she is now able to put cars into the system. Now, that little demonstration there emphasized how when an organization policy changed, when you have different stacks of technologies written in all different kinds of programming languages, and when you want to implement a policy, you want to go ahead and touch those different modules, make the different changes that would require implementing that policy. And with OPA and Policy as Code, you could, cent you could decentralize all your policy decisions into one system, and that is Open Policy Agent. And with that, let's go back to our presentation here and Keynote. So that's the demonstration that we saw, and hopefully that was informative. And right after this, traditionally policies were written as documents, and it has to go through a lot of checks and balances, which is good for a lot of reasons, but why should you consider policy as code? Well, with all the advantages of as code, policy as code helps you with documentation. Compare the code on the right 
code on the left, actually, you're allowing somebody to get cars with a certain car ID if they're a manager, right? And by default, you're denying all requests by setting allows equal to false. So that sort of acts as a nice documentation. And with policy as code, you can actually automate testing and other activities. There's versioning, you can store your policies now in your version control systems and then do all sorts of audit trails about who changed what policy and what was the reason that was changed and so on. So here's a quote from Torin Sandler, who's the co-creator of the Open Policy Agent. Uh, just like how we're treating databases as a separate concern from the perspective of an application, it's like how we treat messaging as a separate concern, monitoring as a separate concern, logging, orchestration, CI, CD. Software development has evolved to treat all these different systems as a separate concern. So it's time the policies that an application is dealing with is treated as a separate concern. And that makes sense. And here's a screen cap from the Open Policy Agent website itself. That portrait itself has a policy-based control for cloud native deployments. It's flexible, fine-grained. It offers flexible and fine-grained controls for administrators across the stack. The picture on the right symbolizes today's modern application development with Kubernetes APIs, controllers, service meshes, and different things. And imagine that you have to implement policy across this entire stack. You would have to learn a different stack, different languages, different manifest files, go change things everywhere with open policy agent. With a little bit of prerequisites, you can implement your policy management solution across this entire stack of applications. And we're gonna see how to get that done. If you go to the Open Policy Agent website, at the moment, here's a lot of different solutions that Open Policy Agent can be integrated with as a policy as code solution. So there's uh, PHP, Spring, Kubernetes, Admission Controller, Authorization, different sorts of API gateway, and so on. If your technology stack is not in this picture yet, there's a lot of samples published by the Open Policy Agent team for various different applications that you can take inspirations from and probably implement Open Policy Agent into your application stack. And we're gonna see how. Uh, here's another uh, reminder that Open Policy Agent, even though the previous slide here spoke about different technologies, as a policy agent solution, OPA does not really know whether the service that is querying OPA to make a certain policy decision, as an example, in, in a car management application, we were managing authorization decisions through OPA. Now that could be any policy decision that OPA can make. So OPA as a system does not know whether the service that it is querying, that whether the service that is querying OPA is Kubernetes or Python or Flask or SSH or whatever, it doesn't really care. What OPA cares about is the service, the, the input coming into OPA is JSON. And after making the policy decision, the output that OPA presents back to the calling system is JSON again. So if you picture this back to our Python example, the backend API sent JSON data to Open Policy Agent. Open Policy Agent made policy decisions on that JSON input and returned JSON back to the service agent. And we'll see how that all worked behind the scenes using live debugging sessions here. So if you wanna implement OPA with your application service or a tool, there is essentially three steps. You gotta create an input for Open Policy Agent, right? And for that, you need to think about the policies itself, what kind of policies that need to be written in the regular language using Open Policy Agent. Once you figure that out, you gotta create an input for OPA and you gotta query OPA. And then you need to check what OPA responded with. In the simple use case, it's a matter of checking for whether this request should be allowed or denied based on the access token and the ID token that was passed as a part of that HTTP request. Now the same principle, 
can be applied for a lot of other technology stacks too. Uh, Kubernetes has this admission concept of admission controllers where you could query a webhook and OPA can be that webhook. And when someone's making an API call to Kubernetes, that can call OPA dynamically with JSON input and OPA can respond back saying whether that request should be allowed or denied or some other action needed to be taken. So with these three steps, how did I integrate the Python Flask backend application with Open Policy Agent? Uh, so we're gonna go look at the sample code and the snippets that you see behind the screen, the first one, create input for open. Now, notice that there's this method called check underscore authorization that is annotated with app.before request. In Python Flask, any method that is annotated with app that before under request gets called before a request is processed actually. And a lot of different programming languages in the web and the API stack particularly support this kind of annotations or they provide you intersection points before an actual request gets processed. So here's one such method check authorization that has this annotation app.before request. And as it says, this method gets called before a request is actually processed. So the first step is to create input for OPA. And that's what we're doing in that little box there. We want the input method as a bare minimum input, which is whether this HTTP method is a get, put, post, or a delete. We want the path of the API that is being called, whether it's slash cars, or slash cars with an ID in case we want to upload a particular car into the system. And two inputs that are needed in this case for OPA to make policy decision to allow or deny. That is the access token and the ID token that the front end application received by authenticating with the Azure ID. And those are four minimal things that is required in this case. With that, the next statement is to Query OPA. We're going to convert that four different data input as JSON, and we're going to send it to OPA, which was listening at localhost 8080 in my local setup. And then once we're done with that, we're going to get the response, get it as JSON, and in this case, we're checking whether the JSON value mentioned whether to allow this request or to deny this request. That's what we're doing there. So what we're going to do is quit keynote there, go back to a local setup of this application. Now, this is the same exact code that we saw in the slides. And I have a local debugging session running right here with the same user that was authenticated. And if I hit invoke, let me fire up my debugging console in the browser. So you could also see the network traffic that goes on behind the scenes. When I hit ignore, there's gonna be two requests that are gonna be sent to the local backend server. The first one is the HTTP pre-flight request for the HTTP options verb. And as you would see, the method there, if I just step over that and go to the input section, you see, you know, the method is options and the path is cars. There's no access token or ID token because it's a pre-flight request. So let's continue this. And the second request that got broken into that breakpoint is actually the request that is getting cars. So there's a method called get, and the path is cars, and there is that big access token, an ID token, that OPA would expect in order to make this query decision. So when we continue, OPA is actually going to call the, the backend application, I apologize, the backend application here, the API, is actually going to call open policy agent running on HTTP, localhost 8000. And once we're done with that, if the response code, we're gonna check whether the request is allowed or denied. And if it is allowed, we continue. If it is denied, we abort that request. And as an example of an abort request, let's just try to change this method as put. And if we invoke, we're gonna go into that section where we abort that request there. And we're gonna get HTTP forbidden there. So this is one simple way, straightforward way, not simple, it's a straightforward way 
of integrating policy as code solution, open policy agent to make authorization decisions for you. Now, what we're going to do next, I uh, jump into Keynote again and then uh, see what it takes to actually write this policy decision. Uh, remember that rego file that we saw before? So how to get that done? Yeah, the other thing to remember is open policy agent makes the policy decision. In this case, it just made the decision of whether to allow or deny a particular request. But it is the job of the service, in this case, the backend service, to enforce that policy decision. That is to either allow with a HTTP 200 or to deny with a 403 forbidden message. So what it takes to write policies in Rego? Well, there is a OPA repo tool that is available as a command line syntax, command line tool. A Visual Studio Code also has an extension that would allow you to write and test policies. And I can cover those two things, but we're gonna go jump into play.openpolicyagent.org right here in my browser. So this is play.openpolicyagent.org. I'm just gonna reload that to show you what it looks like. This is the default. There's plenty of examples here. The one that I picked up in this case to work on this neat little policy to process JWT tokens coming from Azure AD is this particular example uh, that gave samples for JOT encoding. So I took the sample code and started modifying that policy to fit into my use case here. So this policy that you see here, this is the same policy that we saw in this sample application, API oddz.rego. This is the content of this policy. Now you might remember this policy that allowed everybody to get cars. We changed that live to allow people, everybody to put cars as well. That's that policy there. And then the, the, the policy itself further goes down to uh, produce further complicated rules and so on. For example, uh, we're checking whether the input method is options and we're allowing that. Irrespective of whether it has an HTTP header, access tokens or whatever, no, as long as the input method is options, we're allowing that because we want our pre-flight pre request to go through the system. And then here's a way where you can check whether somebody is a manager or not. If you actually wanna look into the token, now here's a sample input that we went, sent to the OPA to make policy decisions. There's those four basic things, the method get, the path cars, access token and the ID token. If you looked in to this access token, you'd see there's a rules called everyone. Now, according to this implementation, if the rules was called manager, then this particular method, car admin, would return true in this case. So there's a little bit of nitty gritties in terms of uh, whether the, the things that are contained inside this open rule is processed as an and statement or an or statement and so on. We're not gonna go into those detailed specifics of the regular language itself today because there is an excellent free course from the creators of the open policy agent that gets you into the syntax of the language. It's, it, it's a bit about four hours. It's a great course and it's worth definitely checking. But for now, when you're in this play.openpolicyagent.org and you figured out your sample input and output, you can evaluate this policy right here. And OPA would run, would send this input to this policy and send you the output here. Now, as you see, the output is JSON. In our sample application, back in Visual Studio, we were only interested in this particular flag, allow or deny. And I could change this to put right here and I can evaluate again and that would return allow is equal to false. That was the only thing that we were interested in, but OPA also returns a bunch of other things which can also be used to make all the different kinds of decisions that your application can make. And here's a coverage option from a testability perspective. When you hit coverage and evaluate, Open Policy Agent would also highlight, well, these were the lines of code that got covered in this case in, with this particular input. And that's also a neat way to evaluate and improve your policy with respect to effectiveness and efficiency itself. And 
that's a little bit about how you can write policies in Rego. There's many samples available on the website itself, and there is a free course uh, from Stira, the creators of OPA. Uh, we at Practical Devs Accounts have also created this awesome list of tools, blogs, and videos, and other resources that you can utilize to get started with policy as code. There's in that GitHub project there. And here's the free course from academy.stira.com that teaches you how you can write policies with Open Policy Agent using the Rego language. Well, that's where I want to leave you with today. Uh, hopefully that little bit of demonstration and the straightforward steps made some sense to you in terms of what it takes to implement Open Policy Agent as a policy as code solution for your technology stack. All right, uh, Maroon, thank you for that excellent talk on open policy agent and policy as code. Uh, we have uh, uh, an opportunity to speak with Maroon live here, and we are going to take a couple of questions from the chat to get started. Uh, the, the first question we have is, from Pritham Nikish, uh, with this concept of policy as code, any op are there any open source tools to specifically identify vulnerabilities for such policies? There's a couple ways that perhaps that could be interpreted. Um, I, Maroon, I'm gonna let you go ahead and talk through that and see what you think they're asking for. All right, thanks David, yeah, so if I look at the question as, are there any open source tools to specifically identify vulnerabilities for the policies that we write? And in this example, policies were written in the Regal language. Are there any weaknesses and vulnerabilities that can get into the Regal language? Is there a tool that would identify such a weakness? Well, I'm not aware of any tool that identifies vulnerabilities in the, in the policies that we write. However, if you look at another scenario, where in terms of a Kubernetes admission controller, you want to stop a container image in a pod being spun up. If the base image of that container is has a vulnerability that was discovered, then open policy agent can be used as an admission controller to detect that instance of a Kubernetes cluster running a vulnerable image, and we could stop that from happening by creating an open policy agent. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I, th I think so. This is really powerful stuff, right? The way that you can inject policy to, to enforce uh, requirements like that. Uh, the second question we have in the okay. chat was from uh, Maha Jav. Uh, cha a change in policy has to undergo risk assessments and impact assessment through change control board. Will that remain a manual effort? Right. Indeed, I hope so, because, you know, we need human beings to be able to make decisions in terms of which is a valid policy for an organization in terms of the risks of the assets that we manage and the other assets that we manage. So, indeed, risk management change impact assessment has to go over the control board. But when it comes to implementing that policy across your entire organization stack, then that's something that can be automated using policy as code through solutions like open policy agent. Excellent. Good question there. Uh, I think we have a little more time here. Let me ask you another question. In practice, how hard is it to turn your organizational or security policy into rego expressions? Is there anything users should watch out for? Well, in general, one advice is start little. For example, policies are normally written as huge documents. So extracting policies that can be coded from those documents into these regular language, that's one of the challenging things from so my perspective. Iterative development. Right, correct, correct. Start small and then uh, test it out and then go from there. Sounds good. Hey, listen, I, I think we're out of time. Uh, Maroon, thank you again for, for the excellent session today. Um, we'll be back shortly with our next uh, session. All right. It's been a pleasure, David. Thank you.
All right, everyone, welcome back. Our next speaker is Jonathan Gil Chavez. Jonathan is a DevOps and site reliability engineer and a full stack developer with experience creating applications in Java, Python, and chaos engineering focused tools used to generate resilient applications. Jonathan likes working with the cloud a lot, especially the Amazon cloud, but is in his current role, he has he has worked with other services and other cloud providers. He also likes working with the console a lot and is always learning new tricks to work more efficiently. With that, I welcome Jonathan. Okay, thank you, David. Um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> um, Jonathan Hill, or could be Johnny Pong in some um, social networks. In other social networks uh, like uh, GitHub or, or YouTube or Twitter, could be find me in JDAN24. Uh, just fine. And a little bit uh, close for response. All very, uh, very answer that could be your take about the technology, about the cloud, about the oh, the Linux, and how to love this technology. Uh, who is Jonathan? Uh, a little more question. Thank you for David for your for presentation about me. Um, I love punk will be my name. Define that. Uh, I love Linux. I love uh, play Call of Duty too. <laughs> it could be uh, play video games. Uh, but I think that I have a responsibility with my knowledge. I share a lot of concept that you could be work with that every day and how to do this new knowledge for all the people that could be done uh, know about this knowledge. I think that it's a very big responsibility, like a Spider-Man, a great power, have a great responsibility. It's a very nice if you can share everything that you know and you learn about the technology and how to could be other people take this new knowledge about the technology and how to apply could be in personal uh, projects or could be in company projects, right? I love this phrase from Confucius, life is really simple, but we insist on making it complicated. It's very fascinating because I love my life very easy, but when I do uh, same tasks one time and one time and one time and a lot of times the same task could be five minutes or ten minutes or or thirty minutes. You need to generate something now for that. Could be generate a tool, could be generate a report, could be generate a CLI that generate your task more efficiently and move this five or 10 or 30 minutes for you and your life could be this uh, automate day for you two, one day, three days or one week, but it's more easy for you, I think, yeah? But these phrases are love and reason for me because I love complicate my life. I live simple, but when I do this, uh, a lot of tasks that it's very uh, repetitive, I need to generate something because I very appreciate that for for my life. Yep. Yeah. Right. Start with that. The contents about the, the talking about the secrets. How to you can use a lot of secrets in AWS, in Azure, in GCP, in Bolt, and how do you can obtain these secrets and how to down for user of Kubernetes, uh, how do you can more easily uh, not generate lock vendor with AWS or Azure or GCP or Bold. You can use uh, external secrets controller for generate these secrets and maintain it's more easy for all your teams. Uh, how do you generate this value for your cluster, especially in Kubernetes, right? Um, a little part of Question and questions and final part for thank you for everyone. Okay, start with AWS SSM. And what is CCAC? CCAC is for me a, the secret in Kubernetes Cloud is the 
more easy for talking about the, a lot of my presentation. It's more easy, say, CCAC. Thank you. <laughs> Parameter store in AWS is a form that you can generate secrets in AWS. Generate a lot of secrets like a secure string, like a string, like a password, like a um, connection of database that you save these and separate and isolate this uh, attribute of security for your IT department, for especially for the security department that could be obtain these secrets and manage this secret a lot of, uh, all of the life cycle of development, right? With this, you can separate the operations, the security, the developer teams that know what, how, how access to the secrets, yeah, right? It's the form that AWS define uh, the secret and how do you can manage the secrets over AWS. It is uh, how do you can create a AWS secret in parameter store. Uh, you define a secret, you define what type of secret is. It's a secure string in this case. You say a KMS uh, key for secure more your string and you can only read this string the personal or the application that generate that can use this string you can define everything in a i mean a iam user a am policy i uh, agents that you can define this in roles over security console in aws right this is the resume about the how do you can see the string that it's a lot of work that you can uh, generate for your SecOps teams, right? How to do the same thing in Azure. Azure define a cable secret in, in a cloud provider in the same path like uh, AWS. You can save a uh, secret, you can save certificate, you can save and um, connection for your database, and how do you can secure more your data with KMS um, key? In this case, is HSM module for manage your keys or manage could be appliance for secure more your strings over Azure, right? But in Azure, you need to generate first a vault, right? It's uh, more steps like uh, AWS or GCP, but it's the same thing that you can generate a secret. In this case, generate a bolt, uh, generate a bolt for access, public access, uh, just for uh, this method. And in this case, generate our secret in the in issue, right? In this case, you can define a policy it could be tagging, tagging the information about the um, secure string that you create, the, the secret that generate what a filter for application filters for uh, could be your billing or your uh, your inventory of IT team. It's a very nice practice using tagging. In GCP, in GCP is the same way. The same, but like a issue, like a AWS, just uh, every cloud define how to manage secret and what type of secret you can store in that. Uh, you can store um, sec uh, plain text or a security string or a certificate, but it's the same, the same uh, objective. Secure my data, my configurational data, my passwords, my strings for connection from a service to a database is the same uh, objective with all clouds, right? In GCP, we can use GCP Secret Manager, create a secret like uh, AWS, and that's it, no more steps. In other uh, way, we can use a HashiCorp poll. HashiCorp poll use the same thing that, like uh, AWS, Azure, and GCP, but one thing additional, that you can generate this ball in your uh, infrastructure, like uh, uh, your local infrastructure or in cloud infrastructure or on-premise or on bare metal, depends on your um, focus that you 
view this uh, approvision of your infrastructure if, if Kubernetes, bare metal, if you use uh, um, infrastructure as code, is uh, on-premise or in cloud, or appliance that do you could be the IT manager, uh, define the concept, but is the same. You can define the, the own um, infrastructure for generating this secret, and how do you can claim, and how do you access this, this secret, right? Uh, in the same part, like uh, uh, Azure, you generate first um, a vault or um, manage all secrets in this vault, right? In this case, uh, generate a um, general propose a key vault uh, for locally proposed. And in this case, generate a secret over the vault, right? Now, start with Kubernetes. Kubernetes is a very big and very uh, used technology now. And what is Kubernetes? Kubernetes is a portable, extensible open source platform for making containerized workloads and service that facilities both declarative configuration automation. It has a large, rapidly growing ecosystem. Kubernetes service support and tools are widely available. Whoa, what is Kubernetes? My goodness, it's a very big uh, and little, little, little definition about Kubernetes. And what happened with Kubernetes? What is the paradigm about Kubernetes? What happened with Kubernetes? Why is so, so difficult this Kubernetes? Because the uh, cure for learn about Kubernetes is very hard. You need to remove all your thing about the infrastructure, about the networking, about the certificates, about the object. And in Kubernetes, you need to learn know now about the new objects, new certificates, how to can communicate um, object with other object, how to work, what is the best practice over Kubernetes. Oh man, it's a pretty hard uh, but for 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 knowledge, but when you move in this path, oh man, the possibilities for generate new ecosystem, for generate new applications, for generate new and grow application, it's more easy. Yeah, I really um, invite of you to learn about Kubernetes. If you try to do and don't can do that can send me a message, no problem. I can help you in every time that I can do it. Okay. Um, what happened with Kubernetes? With Kubernetes, we have uh, these uh, definitions will be in this part. Tenemos. Uh, we have a master node. In master node, we can um, save all data of configuration with Kubernetes that is managed with the worker node. The worker node is uh, the workers that are, I can um, generate a workload in Kubernetes that it's workload called spot. The pod uh, could be uh, related with uh, application or a microservice that is my pod. Over my pod, I can um, use a lot of shape for Kubernetes, use it as secret, use it as service, use it um, load balancing, ingress, a lot of other resources over Kubernetes, but in this moment, focus is in secret. What is a secret? Secret is an object that contains a small amount, a sensitive data such as password, a token, or a key, or a connection string for my application. Yeah. In this case, we need to mount in this pod how to uh, put a little secret or this sensitive data over my application. But I need the, uh, the development team or the architecture team don't know this token, right? Because just need to know the security team know this token or password because I need to generate this new uh, ecosystem about my companies. You need to move the people responsibility about the, 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 the roles, right? 
the developer is not responsible for the password. The architecture is not responsible for the password. Is the security team. In this case, Kubernetes defined a secret for manage that. But I talk about the AWS, GCP, Azure, uh, how do you, I can use this for Kubernetes, uh, how to, if I have this Kubernetes of my on-premise or my other cloud providers, right? In this case, talking about the external secrets. External secrets, it's an uh, operator over Kubernetes that allow to obtain information from my secrets, uh, secrets in AWS, secrets in Azure, secrets in GCP, secrets in Bowl, secrets in every cloud provider or on-premise staff that I can obtain these secrets and generate secrets over Kubernetes in more easy way. Uh, like uh, the GIF is a magic about the Kubernetes, about the, the, the how to can pass this secret for my Kubernetes, especially for my pod. But what is an operator? What is an operator or Kubernetes? Kubernetes implement a pattern about the operator that extended the software over Kubernetes or generate a lot of tasks that can be Kubernetes done do for, for the nature. In first step, uh, the operator increase uh, the powerful over the um, ecosystem over my application. Uh, how do you can explain uh, how do you can uh, generate these new features over Kubernetes and uh, how to manage that with the Go, with Java, with uh, TypeScript, in the language that do you that you want, use it uh, uh, a local environment, deploy over Kubernetes, and could be generate this for the community and increase. In this case, the operator that I'm talking about is external security. It's a very nice. But what what do external secrets? External secrets need some uh, some steps for generate these secrets for your uh, for generate to obtain your secret for your bot, right? First, you need to define what it's the, what type of secret I need to know or what is my cloud or what is the type of secret that I can save of my application. In this case, if it defined if your secret is in cloud or on-premise um, for your provider that you use in your company. Second, you generate a YAML file for obtain the secret. And third, use a secret in closer to your next, right? Sounds very easy. Now it's time for them, right? But a little caution, please don't run this on production, please. <laughs> the IT management is very healthy. I'm very happy if you don't do that in production. Okay, um, right in this case, First, create a secret in Bolt that is doing in, in slide 14. In second, deploy external secret we held in Kubernetes cluster. I have, uh, in this case, some videos, but can share how to do that in online, right? In this case, the first step, add repo into Kubernetes cluster with Helm that it's the, uh, the command. In this case, can check what happened with the, with the external secret help. And leave and rep list. This now added external secret for my Kubernetes cluster, right? When send that. Second, uh, second here, deploy external secret we help in a Kubernetes cluster. Install secrets into Kubernetes. In this step, enable external secrets with Helm over Kubernetes, right? In this case, uh, I install external secrets from external secrets that it's the repo that we added previously. And the namespace that we need to create is external secrets and the namespace, it's the flag for 
create the enable force uh, create namespace in the cluster queue analysis, right? In this case, we create uh, the external secrets and external secrets create uh, something in our cluster. QCTL, get pods, and external secrets, right? External secrets, it's a pod that generate and obtain the configuration that it's the next step. Using external secret operator configure vault, it's a first um, file that we have in there. Uh, is the, uh, the use uh, API in Kubernetes using a secret store uh, type vault that connect for my vault local host. The name is KB test mode. This, this KB test mode is my local host, is my um, service of bold that I use a key here, and the access token is that. I'll show in just the slides, right? Just uh, show my slides in this case. Okay, for your patient will be more easy if you send the start the video will be showing YouTube, but what type of part of QRNet is doing that? Here's at the external secret for help, list the, the installation in our cluster, and third, install the external secrets over a, a Western, over a cluster the QRNS. Force the create any space in this case. Right in this step, we enable external secrets in our cluster and generate this step for the ability the, the external secrets over the cluster in QRNS. External secrets deploy um, a pod, deploy a chart in this case with Helm. In this, in this step, list the external secrets pod. And that's it. That's the pod generated in external secrets uh, previously with Helm. The third step is using external secrets. This is the file that obtained the external secrets, generate the- Hey, Jonathan. Yep. Yeah, sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but I, I wanted to um, wanted to let you know that we're not getting, uh, we're not getting the, the code on the stream. So they're just seeing your slides. So unfortunately you're showing a lot of cool stuff and people are not getting it. Um, but I, anyway, we're, we're, we're running a little low on time here, I think, anyway. Um, maybe maybe we got time for a couple of questions. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Uh, so uh, something I was wondering about, and maybe you could talk just a little bit about this. Um, you know, Kubernetes has a, has a really solid uh, secret store built into it uh, that you can use right out of the box. What, what do you suppose is the main main reason uh, people might consider using an external secret store instead of the one that that comes with Kubernetes? Is it, is it does it have something to do with uh, a pre-existing workflow or or that already works for them or something else? Okay, yeah, it's correct. Uh, Kubernetes obtain and generate tailored secrets, but you can uh, generate more powerful for your DevSecOps team with your external secrets because. Uh, the DevSecOps uh, team normally don't know what is Kubernetes, how to work Kubernetes, but every day it's with you the pain of the what happened with my secret, why the developer put the secret in the code, why the people it's not used currently uh, secret. Then the 
the DevSecOps team normally know about the cloud, how to work the cloud, how to uh, parameterize the cloud, uh, how to, you can access the cloud for application or for the people, but not for over Kubernetes. It's more easy for the uh, DevSecOps team for generate and obtain these uh, obtain these feature for Kubernetes and don't need to know about Kubernetes, just learn and know about the the, the cloud. It's more easy. Um, and this they use actually use in the in the laboratory that I work. Okay. So it, it does actually sound like it has something to do with workflow and making making it easier for people to work together uh, in this in this capacity. Does that sound right? Right. It's like more easy Perfect. for the the people uh, and the a lot of people in the ecosystem for developers, for architectures, for types of ops teams and the IT management because you um, generate the, the responsibility for the people of the um, DevSecOps and the DevSecOps just put the secrets in a cloud provider or on-premise vault and that's it. The magic they generate for external secrets to obtain the secret from your vault, obtain and down from your cluster of Kubernetes and put this, this secret over your pod or your application for access uh, a lot of data. So, excellent. So. Something that I, I used to wonder about quite a lot with the Kubernetes secret store in particular, uh, how, how is access to the secret control stored? For example, in Kubernetes, uh, you know, it uses encryption keys and role-based access controls by default uh, to control access to secrets uh, in, into the applications and people that should have access to them. How, how, might, uh, how might other external secret stores, what methods might they use uh, to to control access to the secrets. Okay. Um, normally, when you define the secret, you can define uh, airbag access for the only the application access for the secret. Now there could be some people that access to the kubectl CLI from Kubernetes. Just the people or just the application, sorry, that they have uh, access for the secret. No, for no for people. Not the uh, the the fuscate, the secret generated over Kubernetes, because uh, when you uh, down the secrets from Q from cloud provider, put this secret in sold mode over Kubernetes, and any person could be read this uh, secret and obtain the the value. But the formal complete. Uh, parameter it's uh, first from the cloud and second over the cluster with airbag got it okay uh so we have a we have a question on the online on the chat uh it's from louise antonez it says i have used the vault concept in ansible before is this one a similar concept uh is bold concept in ansible yeah yeah no problem because ansible uh, apply and generate infrastructure as code when you use ansible or terraform or pulumi or crossplane you need to define some secrets you call uh, obtain these secrets but not with external secrets you need to generate a, a different strategy for obtaining the secret from the cloud from my on-premise uh, infrastructure but the concept could be generated the same. External secret just work with uh, Kubernetes, not for Ansible. Excellent. Well, I think we're about out of time here, so we're gonna we're gonna wrap this up. Uh, Jonathan, again, thank you for your excellent presentation. Uh, it was a really really nice technical talk on on uh, how to implement external secret stores with Kubernetes. Thank you. Uh, for our next talk, we're gonna take a short break. I just stop sharing. Talks, I don't know if that messed anything up.
Hi, welcome to DevSecOps Days Los Angeles. I'm excited to share with you Service Mess to Service Mesh. Here's the part where I tell you I'm definitely going to post the slides on my site tonight. <laughs> I've been that person chasing the speaker, and it's never worked out well for me either, which is why you can go to robrich.org right now, and you can click here on Presentations. Here's Service Mess to Service Mesh right here at the top, and you can get to the slides online right now. While you're here on robrich.org, let's click on About Me, learn some of the things that I've done recently. I'm a Cyril developer advocate. I'm a Microsoft MVP and Docker captain, and I'm a friend of Redgate. AZ Give Camp is really fun. AZ Give Camp brings volunteer developers together with charities to build free software. We start Friday after work. Sunday afternoon, we deliver the completed software to the charity. Sleep is optional, caffeine provided. If you're in Phoenix, come join us for the next AZ Give Camp, or if you'd like a Give Camp here in Los Angeles, or wherever you're connecting from. Hit me up on email or Twitter, and let's get a gift camp in your neighborhood too. Some of the other things that I've done, I do a lot of Docker and Kubernetes consulting and training. And one of the things I'm particularly proud of, I replied to a .NET Rocks podcast episode, they read my comment on the air, and they sent me a mug. Woohoo! There's my claim to fame, my coveted .NET Rocks mug. But let's dig into service mesh to service mesh. Service mess to service mesh. Do you remember when you learned how to drive? Do you remember that freeing experience where you were no longer constrained to just your location, but you could go to the next town or the town after that? <laughs> Let's imagine a country road where we can drive as fast as we want to. That sounds like fun to me. In time, this country road may get, well, a little congested. Hmm, now what? Well, if we're in this country area and suddenly there's too much traffic and, and it's all kind of going in whatever directory, we can try to set up a traffic cop on the edge of town. Now, this traffic cop's job is to find all those people coming into town too quickly and enforce uniformity across the traffic. Now we're all getting to where we needed to go. We're getting there safely. We're getting there efficiently. But, well, we're not getting there as efficiently as we could. We're optimizing for uniformity, not for excellence. Instead, we want something like this, where the cars can communicate together. We can prioritize traffic. We can move that fast moving traffic to one side and the slower moving traffic to the other side. The fast moving traffic can get there as expediently as they need to. Maybe emergency vehicles and people that definitely need to get there quickly. For those people who want to meander more, then they can take a more leisurely drive. Here, we're optimizing not for uniformity, but we're optimizing to ensure everyone gets to their destination as effectively as possible. We use similar analogies as we talk about service mesh. We'll look at what is a service mesh? Why would we want to use one? What came before? What problem does it solve? We'll see a demo of both Linkerd and Istio, and then look at some best practices. Let's dig in. So a service mesh. A service mesh manages traffic between services in a graceful and scalable way. Or said differently, a service mesh is a great answer to, how do I observe, secure, and control the communication between microservices? We'll come back to that a lot. Observe, control, secure. Let's pop that open, observe. As we're watching the traffic move in our cluster, we can watch this, understand patterns, understand trends, get a feel for how our cluster behaves. In time, we can start to route that traffic in very specific ways. You can't talk to this particular pod unless it's moving in the way that you expect. Observe, control, and finally secure. We can create mutual TLS between our pods without the necessity of changing all of our applications. Now this is great, observe, control, and secure. That's what a service mesh can do. Now, how did we get here? Well, we started with a monolithic system. In a monolithic system, we could deploy all of the pieces together in one spot, and we could deploy them whenever they're ready. We didn't do that very often because deployment was hard. Once deployment got easier with Kubernetes and containers, then we moved towards microservices where we could deploy frequently and replace small pieces of our application. That's really neat. With microservices, we can now deploy a lot faster, but we have new traffic patterns. As we talk about service mesh, we'll talk about both north-south traffic as well as east-west traffic. North-south traffic is traffic flowing into or out of our cluster. 
east-west traffic is traffic flowing between our microservices. The beauty of a service mesh is we can control both north-south traffic and east-west traffic. So how did we get here? What came before us? Well, an API gateway. It's the traffic cop at the edge of town. Now, the cool part about the API gateway is it's a fence around our cluster. We can make billing decisions. We can block unwanted traffic. And we have a nice perimeter around our service. Well, that's great. But in this case, the traffic is getting through just fine. But our microservices are connecting to another microservices data source. That's not a good idea. The hard part is the API gateway is a fence around our cluster. It knows nothing of this inter-process communication. API gateways can work on north-south traffic. They cannot work on east-west traffic. So let's get to a service mesh. How does a service mesh work? Without a service mesh, if service A wanted to connect to service B, it would just open a socket and do so. With the service mesh, there's a few more moving pieces. With each pod, we get deployed not only the container for our workload, but also a proxy container. Now, this is together in one pod, so we still have a network isolation boundary here. And so any traffic flowing between the service and its proxy are protected by that pod boundary. When service A wants to reach out to service B, it reaches out to its proxy. The proxy will go check in with the control plane. Is service A allowed to connect to service B? In this case, the control plane is going to say yes. So service A will create a connection to service B's proxy. Service B's proxy again checks in with the control plane. Am I allowed to accept traffic from service B? In this case, the control plane will say yes, and it forwards that request on to service B. Service B replies, and it flows through that connection and back to service A. Now, this is great. The control plane now can make decisions about routing things and also uh, keep control of uh, also observe traffic flowing between constructs. It can observe, control, and secure. Secure, this can be a mutual TLS connection if we choose to, and it has a trust chain through the control plane. That's perfect. So now service A connecting to service B is secure. Service A connecting to an external service, we can have an egress gateway. Or we can have an ingress gateway connecting to our services, and we can secure that in exactly the same way through the service mesh. So we observe, control, and secure the traffic. The beautiful thing is because we're proxying between all of the traffic, we can observe the traffic. We can control the traffic, block patterns that we don't expect, and we can secure the traffic with mutual TLS to ensure that other services can't leak can't sneak in and understand the traffic that we're flowing through our cluster. Observe, control, and secure. Perfect. Well, because we're proxying traffic between all the services, we get much more intelligent things with this as well. We can level up and take a look at our network topology. Now, what's interesting about this is we know who calls whom, not what the designers expected to call what, but we see the actual traffic flowing in our cluster and we can build a network topology diagram. Similarly, we can take a look at service health, understand which services are behaving the way they usually do, which services might be unhealthy, um, behaving in ways that, they, that we don't expect. And we can also log traffic. Let's watch all of the traffic, record the HTTP status codes, record other details about whom contacted whom. Let's level up again and take a look at content. Because we're routing traffic between all of the services, we can do some intelligent routing. For example, an A-B test. Let's create two destination services and understand which performs better, which one gives us a better experience for our users, or which one yields more conversions. We can do those tests and then lean into the results and create a new test. We could also create a beta channel. Let's create this beta channel where certain users can use newer features sooner. We can intelligently route the traffic through our cluster because we are proxying the traffic between every service. We can also do a circuit breaker. Now, if a service is starting to get overwhelmed, it may tip over. And of course, everyone trying to make requests to that service will, of course, retry because <laughs> that's what we do. And so as soon as that service comes back up, it's going to get overwhelmed with this flood of new requests and topple over again. As it pops up again, it'll top all over again. And thus, we have a circuit breaker. We can say, it looks like the service is unhealthy. I'm going to block traffic to it. 
wait for it to recover. Now it can just fail all those requests, give it a 500 error or whatever we need to do to tell our client services not to try again. And then when the service is healthy, then we can automatically close that circuit breaker back up and let the traffic flow naturally. Unlike a circuit breaker in your house, we don't have to wait for someone to physically push the button. The computers can restart the traffic when it's ready. We also got great dashboards across our services. Here's two examples, and we'll see some as we dig into each of the services that we look at. What's really great, observe, secure, and control the traffic. Where we used to have microservices that could call into each other's data sources, we can build filters here in our service mesh to block that unwanted traffic. Now, we'll definitely need to work with our developers to ensure that they build systems that don't rely on that, but we can prevent unexpected traffic in our cluster because we can observe, control, and secure all of the traffic flowing through our cluster. So which service mesh should I choose? Istio, Linkerd, Console, Open Service Mesh, others? Now, the features are always getting better, and so comparing their features will probably yield an identical result. Instead, let's compare their methodologies. First, let's look at Linkerd. Now, Linkerd is really good at making a very fast install experience. What's wonderful about Linkerd is that you can get running really quickly. But Linkerd tends to be kind of bare bones. If you want additional features, you're going to need to go out to additional plugins. What's wonderful is Linkerd likes to build their own content, and so they, com they contribute a lot to the Rust community's network stack. That's amazing. By comparison, Istio tends to be the kitchen sink, where it has toggles to, build, to turn things on and off. It includes the best of community open source packages, so you can get running quickly and not have to worry about grabbing additional plugins. You just turn on or off specific features that you want. Now let's take a look at each of them, service mesh and uh, both service meshes, Linkerd and Istio. Linkerd is the first one that we want to look at, and getting started with Linkerd is really quick. So we'll go off to the Linkerd Getting Started page, and after we download, after, uh, we'll download the Linkerd uh, CLI, and then we'll do Linkerd version to make sure it's running. Linkerd check dash dash pre will validate that our cluster is ready, and then we can Linkerd install, piping that to kubectl apply. Once we've got that, we can do a Linkerd check. I've already done that initial kubectl apply, so let's do this Linkerd check and take a look at our Linkerd cluster. It looks like everything's working out great so far. OK, our next step is to install the dashboards. So let's do exactly that. Let's go grab the dashboards that we want to install, and we'll install those as well. Now, this does take a minute to install. So while it's doing that installation, we can then um, install some samples and finally do a Linkerd check again. Well, let's do a Linkerd check. Now, this Linkerd check will go not only validate Linkerd, but also these visualizations. And what I love about this is it'll actually wait until those visualizations, until all of the components of Linkerd spin up correctly. That's perfect. Now, the cool part about Linkerd is that, we will, um, that it will tag a particular namespace with an annotation that tells us that we should add the Envoy proxy into all of the pods deployed in this cluster. And so it does that for a particular namespace. And if we've chosen to turn on that namespace, then we'll get that content. So let's once it's running, let's start up the dashboards. It will take it a minute to install. Go, 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 go. There we go. So let's fire up the dashboards and take a look. Now here inside these dashboards, we can take a look at various namespaces. Now, Linkerd does deploy Linkerd proxies on the Linkerd things. So let's take a look at these details. Let's pop up a uh, Grafana dashboard and take a look at the metrics associated with this cluster. Now, it's only been running a short amount of time, but so far, it looks like it's pretty healthy. That's great. The majority of the dashboard here is built specific to Linkerd, and we can take a look at all of the particulars. Now, if we don't want to look at it this way, we can definitely also look at it this way. Linker, ah, linker D viz stat. I'll look in the linker D namespace 
and for deployments. Here's all the deployments, and we can see their uptime, their latency, and the number of TCP connections that have been made so far. Now that's great. We could also scrape Prometheus metrics. So that's how we see um, Linkerd. Let's stop this demo and flip over to Service Mesh. Now, Linkerd focused on getting started really quickly. By comparison, Istio focuses on enabling lots of features. So the getting started experience with Istio is really similar. Let's go grab the Istio command line, and then we'll uh, go set that in our path. We can install and set a particular profile. Now, the demo profile has everything enabled, which is great. But you may choose to tune this to be the specific features that you want. We'll also set that Istio injection enabled on our namespace. So all of the pods deployed into that namespace will get that Envoy proxy. Um, Linkerd has an identical mechanism with slightly different syntax. And then we can apply a sample application. Now, this sample application is really interesting. We have a product page. And this product page will reach out to the product details, a different microservice. And then we'll also reach out to one of three review services. Now, there's one review service that shows no stars. There's one review show service that shows stars in black color, and one review service that shows stars in red color. The black and red colored stars will reach out to this rating service to know how many stars to display. Now, as we upgrade our application, we can flow through these versions. In the case of this demo, all three of these are running simultaneously. So if we flip over to the sample application, then we can see that sometimes we get red colored stars, and sometimes we get black colored stars, and sometimes we get no stars at all. Now, we're able to do this because we're routing traffic equally between these three services. Let's take a look at how we do that. Here's this mechanism that routes traffic equally between version 1, version 2, and version 3. Now, let's instead go through a deployment scenario. Let's start at version 1. And so we'll come here. Let's go grab this. And we will say kubectl apply-f this one. There we go. And now we're at version 1. Now if we refresh this page, we will only get instances where there are no stars. So now let's practice deploying. Now as we deploy, maybe we're not super confident in our solution. And so let's do. 80% of the traffic to the old project and 20% of the traffic to the new project. We'll grab this one and let's kubectl apply this one. And now we'll see that four times out of five, we'll still get no stars. But one time out of five, we'll get the new version. Now we could choose other mechanisms to route the traffic, maybe enable sticky sessions to enable so that users don't get a mixed experience. But we get to play with seeing if version 2 is successful. Once we decide version 2 is successful, let's um, flip all the way over to version 2. kubectl apply version 2. And now we only have black stars. Perfect. Now let's upgrade again. But in this case, as we upgrade to version 3, let's start a canary channel, a beta channel. I'm going to say if the user JSON is logged in, they'll be able to get the version 3. But everyone else is going to get version 2. So let's come back over here and kubectl apply dash f. I think I might have just started Visual Studio there. There we go. And so now we've got version 2 if we're not logged in. Let's log in as JSON. JSON, now that we're logged in, now we'll get version 3. So we're able to play with this beta channel. And once we've got this resolved and we understand how this feature will behave, let's log back out. And now we're back to version 2. Now let's upgrade instead to completely to version 3. So I'll upgrade here to version 3. Rename kubectl apply-f version 3. And now, when we refresh, we only get the red colored stars. Now, what's really cool here is that we were able to spin up the new version of the pod, flip over to that version as 
expeditiously or as restrained as we'd like to. Once we're comfortable and we're completely on the new version, then we can take down the old, old pods. There is no downtime experienced in this at all. So now let's switch back to the version where we have version one and two and three running simultaneously. Now, usually we would spin up one version and cut over to it and then spin down the old version. But in this case, we're running all three and that'll be useful for upcoming demos. Now we can see that sometimes we get the red colored stars and sometimes we get the black colored stars and sometimes we get no stars. Ooh, error fetching the thing. That's interesting. So we got to see how um, the Istio um, routing works. Let's take a look at the dashboards behind the scenes. I'm going to take a look at first the Prometheus dashboard, Istio CTL dashboard Prometheus. Now this Prometheus dashboard will show us some of the details inside of our cluster. So if I look for Istio requests total, then I can get all of the particular requests. Now this is interesting, but let's graph this with Grafana instead. Pop out of here and let's flip over to the Grafana dashboard. And now with the Grafana dashboard, we get interesting visualizations. So let's switch to the Istio control plane dashboard. And we can see that the cluster hasn't been running all that long, but we can take a look at, nope, no, I, um, no pilot errors so far. That's great. Let's flip over to the Jaeger dashboard. Now the Jaeger dashboard is really great for being able to trace content across our mechanism. So let's look at, um, nope, uh, search, find traces, and click into one of the traces. And we can watch the traffic move between this service to this service, and finally to this service. And we can see that this service didn't take that long to execute. It looks like this service spent a long time spinning up and processing the results. This service spent a long time processing the results as well. And so seeing the context around our request is really helpful with Jaeger. Let's spin up the Kiali dashboard. Now what's interesting about the Kiali dashboard is not only do we get to see the content, um, let's go to the graph tab and we'll load this content. And right now it's just idle, but let's create some traffic here We'll refresh this a bunch of times. And what Kali does really well is show us the traffic in our cluster and the routes between it. So now we can see that we have traffic here and we can see that um, our product page calls out into the details page that hits the version one service. Our um, product detail also goes the reviews service and version two will hit the ratings, version three will hit the ratings. And if we refresh this a few more times and get some version one traffic in there, we'll be able to see how it will show us version one as well. Now this is really interesting. This is the live network diagram of our services. This isn't what the developers thought was gonna happen, but what's actually happening. If we don't see any calls into the reviews service, then maybe we have a hard coded answer here and we need to look more carefully at that. That's really interesting. So Istio has some really elegant ways to visualize this content. Let's turn off this demo and flip back over here. So we got to see the different methodologies of both Linkerd and Istio. Where Linkerd focused on a really fast spin-up mechanism, Istio focused on including lots of dashboards and lots of really elegant features that we can toggle on and off differently. Which service mesh should you choose? Well, it depends on your needs. Do you have more of a cutting edge need and want to look at maybe open service mesh or console? Or do you need really fast startup time with Linkerd? Or do you need a full 
rich feature set with Istio. As we look at these service meshes, we can look at the various levels of how to engage here. We start at, with the crawl stage, where we get monitoring, logging, and service health, where we can understand the traffic flowing through our, our cluster. Let's in, level up a little bit from crawl to walk. And in the walk stage, we have intelligent routing. We saw in Istio how we could create a beta channel or intelligently flip between version 1 and version 2 only a portion of the traffic. That's possible with the service mesh. Crawl, walk, run. When we get to run, we get this network topology diagram that is exactly what's happening in our cluster. Not what the developers thought, not what we thought, but what's actually flowing through our cluster. That's really cool. Now, as we look at a service mesh, it isn't for free. On the left, we have all of the details associated with our Kubernetes cluster. We have the control plane. We have the worker nodes. We have the pods doing our work. Inside of a service mesh, we have the service mesh's control planes. We have all of the sidecar proxies. Now, granted, we probably aren't running exactly the same horsepower. We have a really heavy Tomcat service and this really lightweight sidecar proxy, then the Tomcat service is definitely heavier. But we probably have double the number of containers running in our cluster, so a service mesh is not free. Expect to spend more on your hosting costs because you're running all of the infrastructure of a service mesh control plane and pods. So when should I choose it? When I need to observe, secure, and control the traffic going through my cluster. I'll observe by proxying all of the traffic through these service mesh sidecar proxies. I'll be able to control it by telling the control plane certain policies so that as the service mesh Envoy proxies check in with the control plane, you can say, no, I'm not going to allow you to connect there. And ultimately, we can secure. We can create mutual TLS between our sidecar proxies to ensure that prying eyes can't see the traffic flowing through our cluster. Observe, control, and secure. Now, service mesh isn't for free. We talked about some of the costs in hardware. So when would I choose service mesh? Well, choose a service mesh if you're running a highly sensitive workload. PKI or PCI, and you need to segregate that from your other work that is maybe less sensitive. Use it as well if you're running untrusted workloads. Keep your untrusted workloads segregated so that they don't end up inflicting damage on your regular workloads. Or maybe you're running a multi-tenant environment. Now, Kubernetes does have namespaces, but namespaces are an organizational unit, not a security boundary. If you want to be able to run multi-tenant Kubernetes, then you need a service mesh to be able to control the traffic flowing between different tenants. If you need security in depth, you can use a service mesh to create uh, secure connections between all points of your Kubernetes cluster. And if you need intelligent routing like an AB channel or uh, a beta channel or AB routing, then a service mesh can give you this type of intelligent routing. A service mesh is a great mechanism for being able to level up your Kubernetes cluster to be able to add observe, secure, and control to your cluster. It doesn't come for free, but it can be a great benefit. Hit me up on Twitter at Rob underscore Rich. Grab these slides right now from robrich.org, and I'll meet you in that spot the conference has designated for Q&A. Thanks.
Hello, everyone. I'm Jeff Hammond, a DevSecOps engineer on Hassan's team at the Software Engineering Institute. I'm here to introduce our next speaker, Frank McCreary. Frank is co-founder and CEO of Aptable, which is a DevOps platform built to make cloud deployment easy for teams that need to meet the most stringent compliance requirements. Today, he will be talking about a security-first approach to product innovation. Hello, Frank, and welcome. Thanks, Jeff, uh, and thank you to everybody out there in the audience who's listening. Um, as Jeff said, today I'm going to talk about uh, approaching product innovation in a security-first way, uh, and specifically thinking about security as a platform in which we can limit flexibility uh, in order to ensure greater security upfront uh, and ultimately achieve the most stringent security and compliance goals with less development effort and rework. Um, today, I would say that there's a lot of effort involved in building and deploying software that meets security and compliance requirements. Uh, and this presentation is aimed at anybody who's felt that pain. So, you know, if you have ever spent time collecting evidence uh, to prove that certain security controls are in place during an audit, if you have used cloud security posture management software, CSPM, um, to identify, review, and fix misconfiguration in your infrastructure. If you've spent effort trying to assemble the right combination of security point solutions to protect your cloud environment. If you've ever had to re-architect a system um, because a new security or compliance requirement necessitated a major change to how you thought about your infrastructure and architecture. And then finally, you know, if you've ever felt like you've repeated these same security and compliance tasks across multiple projects doing the same thing over and over again, uh, this presentation is aimed at you uh, and hopefully trying to convince you that there's a better way. The reason why I think this work is, uh, you know, security and compliance work can be so painful and repetitive is rooted in the most common current approach to DevSecOps, which involves combining multiple tools from different providers across three connected layers of DevOps, security, and compliance. Um, so today I would say that, you know, the majority of teams first make their decision about uh, the infrastructure and DevOps layer. And so they choose a combination of built versus built and bought solutions to get applications and data into the cloud. This is usually some combination of infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, function as a service, uh, and then kind of platform building blocks like Kubernetes. Um, that's kind of the, the, the base layer uh, of uh, of the DevSecOps pyramid. Um, and that's kind of chosen first. And then what most companies do is they layer in security point solutions to solve specific problems that are relevant for their given architecture and risk profile. So they usually choose a solution for vulnerability scanning or, or DAST, choose a solution for intrusion detection, choose a solution for web application firewall choose solutions for maybe container protection and, and workload protection, maybe a solution for dependency vulnerability scanning. And they try and connect these all together in a way that fits the, the way that they've built their infrastructure. And then increasingly today, you know, over the last few years, there's an emerging trend in using uh, cloud security posture management software, which I'm calling the compliance layer. And the idea here is to uh, use software that monitors configuration in order to try and identify gaps or issues where uh, a given configuration doesn't meet an organization's security and compliance requirements um, and, and, and basically surface those so that they can be fixed either at the infrastructure layer or by applying more security tools. So this is kind of the, what I would call the most common status quo. Um, and it doesn't work for a couple of reasons. So the first reason that I, I'm, I believe it doesn't work is that applying finite compliance rules that are defined in cloud security posture tools doesn't work because they're being applied to what amounts to infinitely complex infrastructure. Um, so, you know, thinking about this abstractly, you can imagine a bunch of different infrastructure components that are uh, unique in every way they interact with each other, they change and develop over time. Uh, and you know, in the most common pattern, uh, teams take security and compliance 
components and try and fit these all together. Uh, but this usually breaks down because you know, the components don't quite fit together. They change over time. The relationships between the infrastructure components change. Um, and so there's left with gaps. Um, and so rather than continue talking about this in the abstract, let's see how this plays out in practice. So the first, the first side of this problem is that these finite security posture rules introduce tons of false positives. So as you know, an, an example or illustration of this, what I did is I took the AWS HIPAA reference architecture, which is uh, a quick start guide based on a cloud formation template uh, that is AWS's current best practice recommendation for any company looking to achieve HIPAA compliance in the cloud. So I took that, um, I set it up in a new AWS account with nothing else running there. And then I uh, configured a new uh, Trend Micro Cloud One conformity account, which is you know a common CSPM provider to analyze this environment. So this is kind of like the fresh start environment, just the scaffolding for a HIPAA compliant architecture with nothing else done to it. So I was expecting that this would be 100% compliant, but in reality, far from that, right? So it was overall 69% compliant, which is you know a worse grade than our kind of fully fledged uh, production environment has today. Um, and there were some concerning looking findings, such as you know unprotected public S3 buckets, un unencrypted SNS topics. Uh, AC, network ACLs uh, that had unrestricted public access. Um, and you know these seem alarming at their face. In reality, it's a lot more complicated than that because you know, for example, the SNS topics didn't need to be encrypted because they contained only metadata. And there was no way that they, you know, this per, these particular topics would ever uh, have sensitive information passed through them. And similarly for the uh, unrestricted network ACLs, those were being protected at the security group layer. But this is just an illustration of how, you know, infrastructure components are very, you know, there's a complex interaction between them that is never captured exactly by CSPM rules. And even in this simple perfect case where this is, you know, a, a static architecture that has not been iterated on, that has been custom built for compliance specifically, there's a lot of gaps between uh, kind of what uh, the architecture thinks is security and compliance and what a static CSPM tool thinks is that. And so you can imagine this just only gets worth worse over time as this architecture gets iterated on. The flip side of the coin is that CSPM tools also introduce false negatives based upon what they're not able to determine through configuration uh, analysis alone. So a common example of this that we see with our customers at Aptable um, is, and this isn't unique to high trust, but it does come up very often for customers undergoing a high trust audit. They see that all SSH activity must be logged. Um, so any SSH session, all of the standard in and standard out has to be logged in a central place that can be examined in the event of a breach. So this is not just you know, HIPAA or high trust related. This is a, a good security best practice for observability. So for teams that haven't set this up before, usually what they do is they, again, you know, they pick a set of point solutions uh, in the security layer to, to overlay onto what they've chosen for their infrastructure components. Um, and so, you know, there are a ton of good purchasable options here. Um, and, you know, they, they could use HashiCorp Boundary, they could use Teleport, they could use Session Manager, which is part of AWS Systems Manager, or they could roll their own solution. Um, and that, you know, these aren't the only solutions, there's many more. But when they do this, you know, in, in kind of the, the fully uh, the observable compliance setup, they would want to set up their CSPM to be able to see whether they'd done this correctly, not just now, but going into the future. And it turns out that no CSPM solution can properly determine whether all SSH session activity is properly set up and logged because there's many different moving parts here, right? First, there's identifying which ports are, are exposed and accepting SSH traffic, which of those are protected by a, uh, you know, a log, a, a, an SSH server solution that logs all activity and whether that solution is properly configured. There's no solution that, that correctly monitors all these three parts. So, uh, you know, a company that's invests in this security setup 
they don't have confidence that they've set it up correctly the first time. And that confidence gets worse and worse over time as they introduce new systems uh, and new ways to SSH into infrastructure. Their compliance layer is never gonna tell them whether they're doing a good job there. And this brings me to the second problem with the current status quo, which is that you know the current, the, the traditional DevSecOps lifecycle is an infinite loop uh, that you can't win. Um, so many of you have probably seen this diagram or some variation thereof. I believe that this is the original. Um, it's definitely gotten a lot of mileage over the last five years, and I may be wrong if this is not the original. Would love to hear. Um, but I think you know this. This came from Gartner in 2016, and I believe is is the uh, the archetype for all of the other DevSecOps loops you've seen. Um, I get what this is trying to do, which is to articulate a robust and complex process. But when I look at this, I just think about a giant hamster wheel of despair. And you know, it's uh, it's a little more interesting than a single loop hamster wheel. You know, you've got a, a couple different intermediate loops in here that you can get stuck in. Um, but you know, overall, this doesn't seem like a pleasant experience to be in. Um, and, and and to sum up what I, I think are the two core problem interactions. First, anytime there's new feature development, it inevitably triggers new work to prevent and detect security incidents. So basically, you need to uh, plan every single new development initiative with security and compliance in mind. Uh, and on the flip side, every you know it's not just new development that happens. It's not just the infrastructure that's changing. The security landscape is changing new compliance requirements are emerging, or maybe there's a new need, new, a new regulation that a company is being subject to. Also security incidents can surface previously unknown risk surface area. And these feed back and demand new feature development or new security product security development. And this just never ends. And this is how development works in the DevSecOps life cycle. So, you know, one, one recent initiative to improve this is compliance as code. And this is a, a valuable initiative. Um, the idea here is to move the discovery and implementation of security requirements earlier in the software development life cycle. Um, you know, this is what marketing and other material would call shifting left. Um, this is definitely an improvement in process. Uh, it's a great way to mitigate risk because you're able to identify vulnerabilities earlier in the process but it doesn't solve the fundamental problem that there's still a significant ongoing effort to protect cloud applications and meet compliance requirements. So, you know, going back to the SSH session logging example, uh, a, a company that was in, investing in compliance as code would probably have some sort of uh, policy as code defining that all SSH activity needed to be logged. But, uh, you know, and, and that would prevent them from implementing a new system that had SSH access and realizing only at the time of security review that they hadn't considered this requirement, only to have to go back and re-architect and rebuild the whole thing. So that's a good thing, but they still need to be thinking about this. And every time they introduce a new way of, uh, you know, a new system that maybe can't or hasn't been built to fit in with their existing compliance or security solution, they need to solve that every single time. So, I'm gonna argue that this isn't necessary. And there's actually a solution here that involves uh, providing security as a platform. And there's a trade-off here, right? The trade-off is that we limit the flexibility of what the infrastructure or DevOps layer can do, but in exchange, we are able to ensure security upfront with less effort. So going back to the, the abstract example of our Tetris, Tetronimos or Lego blocks, Think about, you know, instead of trying to fit security solutions onto infrastructure components that weren't exactly built with each, each other in mind, what if we provided a DevOps platform that supported just a limited set of infrastructure components? But for each of those components, the platform provided security controls that were baked in so that there's no additional security configuration necessary and no feedback loop between the compliance layer, you know, in other words, the CSPM tools, and development. The platform just knows how to secure each component that it supports. And so it can apply the right security controls to meet any set of compliance requirements. So that's the idea. And that's what I'm, I'm talking about in the abstract. 
uh, when I refer to a security platform. I'm not going to be able to talk about everything that goes into building such a security platform here. So I want to focus on examples of what I see as the three pillars of such a platform, which are uh, simpli simplification, control, and enforcement. <clears throat> so when we talk about simplifying, we mean the platform should only support components that it knows how to secure. That's again, you know, limiting the flexibility of the platform. And similarly, the platform should be the only one that makes changes to the underlying system that it sits on top of. And it should monitor and alert on any changes that are made not by the platform. Um, and then finally, it should enforce security controls. So unlike CSPM, which traditionally just monitors and alerts and then requires additional work to remediate, the platform should just prevent things from happening that would be violations of, of security or compliance requirements. Um, so let's look at the first of these, the first of these pillars, which is to simplify. Um, and one way to do this is to think of, uh, you know, a handful of security or compliance requirements that a company might face and how that might impact the, the decisions of how that company's platform, their security platform would be, would be built and, and what it would allow versus not allow. So let's say uh, you've got a compliance requirement that all of your app dependencies, be it NPM packages, Ruby gems, whatever, must be scanned for vulnerabilities before deployment to production. Um, if this was a requirement, you might build your platform in such a way that, you know, for any app deployment, you only you require a Git repository, something where it's obvious what the code is, and that's the encapsulation, as opposed to maybe allowing pre-built Docker images or AMIs or some other built image format. Because in this way, the platform can take responsibility for scanning the repo using, you know, built-in tools that it trusts, uh, and building and deploying an image only if no vulnerabilities are found. So, another example is, you know, imagine that uh, there was a compliance requirement that all all endpoints, so all web accessible endpoints, must be scaled da scanned daily by a vulnerability scanning tool or a DAST. So, you know, in this scenario, we might decide that the platform will be inflexible in terms of letting the client choose what it's exposing and how. And so uh, the platform might require clients to specify all web listening ports and expose only those ports via, web uh, via load balancers and uh, security group or firewall rules. And because it does that and it's controlling everything that's exposed, it can be responsible for setting up automated daily scans. Now, I will say that that's an oversimplification. And if you want those vulnerability scans to be meaningful, you need to apply additional uh, constraints and, and limitations. Um, and, you know, a third example here is, let's say that uh, you have a, a, a reliability requirement to distribute all web applications across multiple data centers, or you know, in the case of AWS, multiple AZs. In this case, instead of letting the client choose a container placement, you might allow them only to specify a container size in terms of RAM and CPU and a count. Uh, so, you know, um, a count greater than or equal to two. And then the platform would be responsible for making sure that all of those containers were scheduled across AZs. So again, these are examples of how we limit flexibility in order to be able to guarantee a, a given security control. The other side of limiting flexibility is making sure that the platform is the only actor making changes to the underlying layer. That could be infrastructure as a service, it could be Kubernetes. Um, but the point is, you know, any change that's made outside of the platform can't be trusted. You can, of course, lock this down with, uh, you know, IAM rules and other kind of uh, ways to prevent access. But you should always have this backstop where you're making sure that even if you misconfigure your access rules, these changes aren't happening. And so, you know, one way that this happens, say, with uh, making sure that there are no outside changes to AWS is ensuring that the platform makes all of its API calls with an identifier unique to the change request. So, you know, the platform for any change request can uh, use the STS API to assume a role, a new role, and get a new AWS access key. And then, you know, that will be logged in CloudTrail and a separate 
process, an audit reconciliation agent can examine every single API call logged in CloudTrail and alert on any change not made by the platform. So it looks at the access key ID for every single API call. If it sees it tied to a, a specific known change request, it says okay. If it doesn't, it says no and alerts. You can extend this actually to get you know, uh, defense in depth security for the platform itself um, by you know, identifying a signature of API calls or changes that you expect to happen from a given change request. And if you see an API call that's different, you could also alert on that. So this isn't just relevant for you know, security platform functionality, but it's a, a good practice in general to be reconciling the system audit logs. And so, you know, if we limit the, the platform flexibility in this way by only supporting components that we can secure and making sure that the only changes that are made to infrastructure are by the platform, everything has to go through the platform, then we're able to uh, achieve this third pillar, which is that the compliance layer should uh, not only monitor for configuration issues or gaps in security and compliance, it should prevent them. Um, <clears throat> And so, you know, the, the image on the left here kind of illustrates how CSPM traditionally works today. It identifies where there's a gap, it alerts you to it, but it still allows that to happen. And it expects you to go through the, uh, go through the alerts and fix anything that is broken. If we have a security platform though, we can do even better, which is that we can have a toggle on the platform um, to require logging for all SSH sessions. So set the platform up to do the thing that you want it to do. And then the platform, instead of just alerting when there's an environment that, that doesn't have uh, you know, a logging destination set up for SSH, it can disallow SSHing into that uh, environment <laughs> and can basically prevent the compliance rule from even being violated in the first place. This not only increases peace of mind, it lessens the amount of work required to maintain the system because now you don't need anyone to go into the CSPM tool on a regular basis and see what's broken because you can trust the platform to enforce those rules. So hopefully, you know, th these examples have illustrated kind of what, what I mean by this concept of a security platform um, and uh, what, uh, why it might be beneficial, but what's the catch? So I think the main, the main catch here is that building a security platform is hard. Uh, if a platform doesn't anticipate future compliance requirements, you're still left with the original problem, which is that you constantly have to update the platform when a new compliance request comes in that hasn't been anticipated. Um, and so whoever builds this platform has to be expert in compliance, not just the requirements of current frameworks, but also the underlying principles that span every framework so that, you know, when a new compliance requirement comes up in the future, um, the platform has already taken it into account and its components uh, can be secured to that requirement. The other thing is that, you know, this just in general, Designing components that solve a general problem take a lot more effort than solving for a specific instance of the problem. And you know, as an example of what I mean by that, consider building a, a platform component that can meaningfully run vulnerability scans on any web application without knowing, you know, it it, it just works um, for every single web application. It collects the information it needs to run meaningful scans. Designing that component takes a lot more effort than setting up proper DAST for just a single web application that you know everything about. But despite the fact that this is hard, it can be done and it is being done. Um, so larger enterprises are already doing this. This was the main focus of the Puppet 2020 State of DevOps report, um, which examined internal platforms. It wasn't entirely focused on security platforms, but one of the big uh, reasons that larger enterprises are moving to inter internal platforms is to align DevOps performance gains with their own unique compliance requirements. And the majority of larger enterprises are already doing this. Um, for these larger enterprises, they have the in-house expertise and they have a large enough engineering team so that building one internal platform to service many application teams ends up not only improving security, but also saving time and money. 
but not everyone is that large enterprise that has the in-house compliance expertise or an engineering org large enough to achieve this sort of economy of scale. And so for the rest of us, I believe that there's value in developing a common public security platform. The sorts of the, the kind of class of problem that we're talking about here is very similar to the sorts of problems that cloud computing solved uh, when on-premise deployment was still the norm. Um, there is benefit in solving a problem once, learning from the compliance and security needs of hundreds or thousands of organizations and baking it into one platform that everybody could use. Um, so that's all I have for today, but uh, you know, again, my name's Frank, I'm from Aptable. These are the sorts of problems that we're solving every day. So if you have more questions about this, if you're interested in the sort of security platform we've built, or if you're you know, an engineer who's, who's interested in solving problems like this, we are always hiring. Um, you can email me at frank at aptable.com. And thank you. I think just to throw a few things out, of course, the, the analogy of the giant hamster wheel of despair uh, when looking at the, the kind of dev ops infinite loop, that was that was great. I got to chuckle out of that. And I think it rings true for a lot of us that work in this in uh, the DevOps area as well. Um, so you mentioned a few things that stood out to me. We, we talk about limited, limiting flexibility. Um, could you kind of go a little bit more into that specifically is that something that is could be like an easy win on the path to um, a security as a platform approach? Yeah, I mean, I think so. The this is another like there's the idea of an iron triangle where there's three things. Like I think it's uh, it comes up in product management, right? So it's like resources, uh, quality, and time, right? With security, it's kind mm -hmm. of like easy, flexible, and secure. You can only pick two. Uh, and the majority of teams today are picking flexible and secure. Um, and I think that maybe the shift in mindset is trade off flexibility uh, and have something that is easy and secure. Um, and, and teams are using this today. And there are components where people are, I mean, there's, uh, there is wide adoption of uh, you know, Terraform providers that already bake in security. Um, and so teams are doing this on a small scale for individual problems. Um, and I think the, step, the next step is to kind of lean into, at least for certain applications, have an opinionated platform that controls all of them. I think that the toe in the water for a lot of teams here is to not do it for their entire architecture, but carve out the piece that has the most sensitive data, the most stringent compliance requirements, put that part onto a platform like this, or you know, build a, a platform that just handles the needs for that one piece, start there. That's a little bit um, less intrusive than changing everything, but still achieves kind of the 80% of the goal, which is securing the most sensitive data and applications. Thank you. Um, yeah, so another, another great point I think you made early on was when you're talking about uh, the, the finite security posture rules. Um, which I think was an interesting point. So you're trying to, it's it's almost like you can't apply finite rules to like an infinite process. Um, so in general, can you just elaborate on how somebody that wants to get closer to security as a platform posture can keep that in mind? Is it like a continuous system where you just have to continuously anticipate new um, new compliance rules coming in? How would you track that sort of thing? Yeah, so it was, I think the statement I made was uh, was relatively broad, but I think you, there's a little more nuance to it, which is that there are some systems that can be analyzed pretty well through configuration. So, you know, if you're using S3 for object storage, the ways to secure that are largely defined through configuration. And there's not too much more that you can be doing outside that impacts the overall security of that system. So if you are, um, if you are restricting uh, access to the buckets through IAM, if you are uh, ensuring encryption at rest using like the right key management strategy for your org, if you are preventing uh, long-lived uh, access keys for 
the, the data in the buckets, like that's probably a good start. Um, and that's a more simple system for, uh, for other systems. Like if you're running proprietary applications on EC2 instances, that's where it's just really hard. Um, and like the CSPM I'm arguing doesn't get you very much there. And so like the shift is to move from those systems that are really open-ended and complex and choose systems that are more confined that might just be choosing a, you know, moving to a function as a service or a platform as a service in general, or it might be going all the way to adopting a security platform that handles not just the simplification, but also the, the security and compliance visibility. Thank you. So I think we're at time. Um, so again, Frank, thank you so much. Frank McCreary from Aptable. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, we're going to take a short break, I believe, and we'll be back in 20 minutes. Hi, I'm Tanya Janka, also known as She Hacks Purple, and I am the founder of We Hack Purple. Uh, I am the face you'll see the most often. I am the one that creates most of our content, although we are bringing on new instructors as we speak. I have worked in IT a really long time. I started coding in the early 90s. I got my first job in the late 90s, and the IT industry has not been able to rid themselves of me ever since. I discovered security in my 30s and got really excited about it and found that application security was the part I loved, the part I liked the best. And so since then, I have been speaking at conferences around the world, training people around the world. Um, I've won a whole bunch of awards, which is really great. And then I published a book last year in 2020 called Alice and Bob Learn Application Security, which it became a bestseller the first week. Thank you. But basically, I'm a nerd on the internet who is really, really excited to help people learn security. And that's why I started this company. And I really hope to see you become a part of our community, a part of our academy, a listener of our podcast. I'll take what I can get. Um, but mostly, I hope that We Hack Purple can help you create more secure software. The SCI is a research organization on the cutting edge of cybersecurity and software engineering. We are based at Carnegie Mellon University, a global research university annually rated among the best for its programs in computer science and engineering. We serve the nation as a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense. Using proven software engineering principles and practices, we serve as a national resource in software and information assurance, cybersecurity, and data modeling and analytics. The SCI offers a diverse, inclusive environment 
that fosters collaboration to spark innovation. Our employees are excited to work together to solve our nation's toughest problems. It's an incredibly exciting time to be in the software field. Software is not only one of the biggest challenges that we face, but also where innovation lies. The SEI is the birthplace for cybersecurity. The CERT program started in 1988. This resulted in the establishment of the first computer emergency response team right here at CMU. We build on a strong foundation of theoretical research by creating prototypes, conducting demonstrations and real world pilots, developing training, publishing our findings, and delivering capabilities that organizations can use. We are driven more by the desire to address complex, long-term problems in an innovative way rather than selling a specific product or service. As a part of my work, I serve as a liaison between academia and the government. The motto of our center is to make the recently possible mission practical. So one of the things I like the most about working here at the SEI is the ability to kind of choose your own adventure. You're given the freedom and flexibility to take a body of work and make it your own. Make it something that's suited to your skills and interests and apply your unique talents and techniques to ways that can benefit the DOD. It is also very rewarding to be a part of a world-class university in computer science and engineering like Carnegie Mellon University. A global research university with more than 13,000 students, 100,000 alumni, and 5,000 faculty and staff. Our community bridges the art and engineering worlds, is a world leader in robotics, and is home to one of the world's best schools of drama. The ability to be part of this community and collaborate with the diverse research talent on campus really sets us apart. And really, the Pittsburgh area has something to offer everyone. We have lots of arts, sports, outdoors, and I get to be a part of that here on campus. At CMU, I have the ability to continually expand my skills in the latest cutting edge research and technologies and use that knowledge in my work. So one of the great benefits of working at CMU is you get to take any classes that you want completely for free. I've been able to take advantage of the tuition benefits to continue my education while I work here at the SEI. If you're a student looking to expand your education beyond what you can learn in school and earn money doing it, we want you to come work with us. The interns I manage do real work writing code, analyzing data, and collaborating as valuable team members. As an intern, I've had the wonderful opportunity to work with many SEI experts. I could see myself transitioning fairly easily into any sector that they would want me in. We are at the nexus of academia, the Department of Defense, and government. Our people make this exciting. I joined for the mission, but I've stayed for the people. I am. I am. I am. I am the SEI. We are the SEI. Come join us. The work that we do directly impacts our nation. For more information about available career and internship opportunities with the SEI, please visit our careers website at sei.cmu.edu slash careers. We hope that you'll join us.
Hello, everyone. So we are back into the DevSecOps Days LA event, and we are in the afternoon session. I'm really excited to have uh, Tanya Gianca, and she's our keynote speaker for today. And Tanya, she is also known as a Shehex Purple, and she's a founder of the shehexpurple.com as well. And she's a best-selling author of the Alice and Bob Learn Application Security. So I really like the book. I read it. It was very good. And giving a practitioner perspective for the developer, everybody else, what to do with the application security. And as I said, she is the also founder of the We Hack Purple, an online learning academy, community, and podcast that revolves around teaching everyone to create a secure software. This is perfectly aligned with our DevSecOps community because that's our job. So I don't want to be extending so much. I'm really eager to listen, Tanya, about great talk. Um, it's more than just a pipeline DevSecOps. So Tanya, floor is yours and happy to have your session. Awesome, thank you, Hassan. Thank you everyone for having me. I am super excited to speak at DevSecOps Days. At first it was just DevOps Days and then they created DevSecOps Days and I was like, yes, every talk is good. Not that all the other talks are good, but I want them to all be about security. I'm pretty biased. So in this talk, I'm gonna tell you about all the cool security things we can do that are not in a pipeline. So I find that a lot of DevSecOps talks aren't about all the other parts of DevOps. It's just, I'm gonna put 26 tools in my release pipeline and that doesn't go very well. It doesn't go with the idea of being fast and accurate and precise. And so actually, let me just tell you, so what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna to talk about the fact that DevOps is not just pipelines. We're going to talk about the fact that, or in my opinion, DevSecOps equals AppSec and SecOps plus DevOps. Yes. We're going to talk about AppSec programs that work with DevOps and all the parts specifically that are outside the pipeline. And this is, you might be thinking like, well, I thought she was going to put 40 tools in a pipeline. I'm disappointed. Yeah, I already have a bunch of talks about that and videos and all sorts of stuff. But DevOps is more than that. So we're gonna actually define a bit of DevOps so you kind of understand what I'm getting at in case we're talking two different languages. So I'm Tanya and we do these like um, about me slides specifically because uh, we want you to know we're qualified to give our own talk. So I realize I'm the keynote, but we still like do this about a slide. It's not because we want to present our resume. It's because we're hoping we'll be like, see, I'm very qualified. Please watch my whole talk. Don't go surf the rest of YouTube. I know there are a lot of very cool cat videos on YouTube. I am aware there's a lot of cute cats, but I hope you'll just stay with me for around 35 to 40 more minutes. Um, and basically I'm a nerd on the internet. That's what I do. So. What is DevOps? And I know you're thinking, I already know, but I'm gonna talk briefly about a few things and define them because you might be a beginner, because you might subscribe to part of DevOps and not the entire thing, because I want us to speak the same language for the next 40 minutes. So what is a CI CD? So CI stands for continuous integration. And what that means is actually, what, what that means is Basically, so I used to be a dev, and then I became a pen tester, well, briefly a CISO, then a pen tester, and then I discovered AppSec, and I was like, there's nothing else, that's all I want to do. And um, what we used to do when I was a dev is like, you'd all program together, you'd talk to each other, and you push things into the main branch all the time. But there'd be that one junior dev that disappeared for six weeks, and it's like, that guy's suspiciously quiet. And he would have made some other thing that he thinks is the best thing ever. And then he or she comes back and they like push it into the main branch and shatter everything. And I'm like, you waited six weeks to test your integration. And of course it doesn't fit because the main branch, all the rest of us have been changing it all together, integrating regularly. So continuous integration means constantly, repeatedly, all the time, integrating your stuff back into the main branch. So all of our pieces work nicely together. Continuous delivery, in my opinion, is using automated software to make that integration happen. 
So it's the fact that you're using a CI CD pipeline, the fact that you're using pipeline software like Jenkins, Azure DevOps, GitHub Actions, Bamboo, Circle CI, et cetera, et cetera, GitLab. There's a zillion of them. So it's using software to automate this so it goes well. And then continuous deployment. So CD sometimes stands for continuous deployment. And what that means is when you have so many different tests, verifications, that you feel confident that you no longer have to manually improve, approve anything, that if it passes every single test, that it can just go out into prod and be free on the internet or your intranet or in your cloud instance, wherever you're going to put it. Most companies don't do continuous deployment. That is rare in the wild. There are some, but it's certainly not 50%. It's, way, it's a much smaller number, trust me. And so that's what those things stand for. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And then what is what? why do we do it? So devs couldn't just say, hey, we want to use this software because we think it's cool. They had to give reasons, right? And so you can word it a lot of ways, but here's reasons why I tell clients that I think they should consider deploying with CI CD. So trunk-based development, so like constantly checking things and constantly integrating is less risk. If you have a tiny, tiny change and then another tiny change and it's this big risk. Waterfall or water fail, depending upon how you call it, it's just like this huge, 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 huge change and then you know what the bottom of a waterfall looks like, right? It's crashing, smashing. <laughs> um, I have lived that because I started programming in like 1994, 1995. Um, and I got like my first job in 1997. And I was like, I'm so excited. I'm going to take over the world. And I did a lot of water fail. Automation meets, means speed and accuracy. Like those manual tests, those like having QA do all these tons of manual tests, like that's not usually a thing anymore. Or if it is, it's very expensive. If you, every single test that you can automate, that means that QA person can do one, way more interesting work, two, challenge themselves, have more fun, three, find new ways to find new bugs. And when we integrate often, it means that we have less errors. It means there's less things breaking it, in prod. It means that we meet deadlines better because we're checking all the time to see if we're okay. So I want to, I know you're thinking, I know what AppSec is. I'm at DevSecOps days. Come on, Tanya. But I'm going to give you my definition. So what is application security? It's every single thing that you do to make sure that your software is secure. That could be secure code training. That could be hiring a pen tester to come in and just a, like smash your app relentlessly. It could mean doing threat modeling sessions for every new project design to see what the possible risks are and then trying to mitigate them. It could mean a dev listening to a cool podcast and then hearing, oh, this version of this software is supposed to be really insecure and I checked at work and one of our apps has it and I think we should update off of it. It sounded really scary in the podcast. All of that is you fighting the good fight to make things more secure. And so then what is DevSecOps? It, it's application security. It's the same things we've always wanted, but we've adjusted it so it works within the flow and processes and tooling that the DevOps people are using. So my friend Imran Mohammed told me that. He's like, it's what we've always done, Tanya. We just need to adjust ourselves. We don't want to break all their awesome DevOpsiness. Just kidding, I said DevOpsiness. He has better grammar than I do. Okay, so the three ways of DevOps. So I'm going to talk about this a lot for the rest of this talk and how we can do all these different security things within these three ways. The three ways of DevOps come from the Phoenix Project. I don't know if you can see over my shoulder, but I have the Phoenix Project Accelerate. <laughs> <laughs> the DevOps Handbook and the Unicorn Project all sitting over there. I also have audiobook versions of them. Um, okay, back on track. Don't tell them how much you love the books over and over. That's enough. But basically the three ways of DevOps. So if you are doing these three things, then you're doing all of DevOps. Quite often people are doing one or two of them, or they're doing some of each one, but they're not sure. We want to do all of them 
to get the maximum benefit that we can. So the first way of DevOps is to emphasize the speed of the entire system. And when I first read that, I was like, oh, not just my part. <laughs> when I was a dev, I just could, 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 done, right? It didn't even occur to me to help the QA team or to work with the security team so they could be ready for, I was just like, this is my part. That sounds like a you problem, but we're changing the way we do this. And if we want the entire thing to go fast and we want the entire system to be efficient, that means I actually have to speak to other humans. And I don't mean I have to be like social butterfly, although I am, but I have to work with everyone to make sure the whole thing is fast. There can't, if there's one part that's really slow, all of us, the whole system's slow, right? And so that was a bit of a pinch of thinking for me. Then there's fast feedback. And I like to add to this fast feedback that is accurate and going to the right people at the right time. So this is the thing security has traditionally really stunk at. We have sucked a lot at fast feedback. We have been very famous for coming in later and then telling everyone what a bad job they did instead of showing up at the beginning and trying to help walk the path with them to make sure they go down the secure path, which is the one we want them to do, right? And so for us, fast feedback is really important. It requires some changes, but that it will make the end product so much better. And then the last one is continuous learning, which is what you viewer right now are doing. You are participating in this one, continuing to learn and perfect and hone your skills. Sometimes this is called taking time to improve your daily work. And this can also be called risk taking and experimentation for learning so that you can constantly improve. You wanna do that so that you can make sure you're awesome at the first and second way of DevOps. And now you're thinking, you're like, but what about pipelines? I thought DevOps was just the software that you bought like Jenkins and then it just releases stuff for you. Pipelines are a part of the first and second way of DevOps. Like you need to have automation to go quickly. You need to have automation to be super efficient and accurate. But it could also be part of number three if you're doing it right. So you could learn about how you can do things with pipelines. You can work hard to tune all your tools so your pipeline runs way faster. And that would be you working to improve your daily work. So it kind of depends. But the main message of this talk that I, I want to give you, but I'm going to give you a lot more. If you put every single thing into your pipeline, <laughs> devs will not, dev and ops will not invite you to parties anymore. If you sit there and put like a static application security testing tool and you tell it to scan the entire code base and you haven't tuned out the false positives, it's gonna sit there and run like six hours and it's gonna be tons of false positives. It's always gonna fail the build. And then dev and ops are gonna say, that security person, Tanya, is the worst. Our pipeline used to run six minutes. Now it runs six hours and it always fails. Boo. The purpose of DevSecOps is not to add 500 tools to your pipeline. The purpose is to make sure that the apps that Dev and Ops are creating and supporting are as secure as we can make them. And so we need to weave ourselves through what they are doing gracefully so that we can get them that fast feedback they need so we can continue to teach them and to help them improve their daily work from a security perspective and so that we can make sure that we are flowing super fast like they are. And so if we wanna succeed at AppSec and we're working in a DevOps environment, we need to adjust. And some things should go in a pipeline and some things shouldn't. So I am going to talk about goals that an AppSec program can have because basically we always have certain things we're trying to accomplish and how we can do them well without shoving 47 tools in the pipeline. So some of these, I mean, you could also do that, but I wanted to help you think outside the box a bit because I, I just see so many places where they have like, I one place they had 11 tools. It took an hour and a half to run the security tools. They'd worked so hard, so, so hard 
to implement them, get them working well, tuning them, and like they've done a great job, but an hour and a half, every time you push a line of code, I mean, come on. So let's continue. Oh, apparently I decided to do the fancy, yeah. I'm still learning PowerPoint, I swear. Okay, so one of the first goals of any AppSec program is taking inventory. You want a list of all of your apps, right? You want a list of all of your APIs. Ideally, you would have an SBOM, a software bill of materials of all of like the supply chain, all the components, third party libraries, whatever's, plugins that you need to make your software. You want a list of all of that so that you know what you're protecting. And so there are actually lots, there's tools on the market that you can buy to help you with this and you don't have to put them in a pipeline. Um, there, you could do manual searching for all of your apps and by manual, I mean using Nmap and just looking like, is port 80 open? Is port 443 open? Um, like you can, um, oh, there's just so many tools that are like, you could scrape your domain publicly and then like, scan down it with like a web proxy or like a, um, a directory brute forcer. So there's lots of tools that could help you do inventory, but you don't need a pipeline to do that. Now, every app that's in a pipeline, you wanna make sure it's in your inventory, but whatever's in your inventory that's not in a pipeline, you can now put that into a pipeline and then you've just helped, I hope you've just helped your dev and ops teams, right? Like, oh, we forgot about that legacy app. Yeah, well, it still has bug fixes. So this is a tool, like this is a, a thing that you could do. Oh, actually, okay, so apparently I had a list of, <laughs> I was just trying to remember all of my things for this note. Okay, so basically there's a whole bunch of ways that you can do inventory that's automated and fast, but that does not need to be in a pipeline, which means you don't have to bother dev or ops at all necessarily. If you're gonna do scanning with Nmap, you probably wanna tell the security operations team so they don't think you're a malicious actor. You're gonna probably need to talk to your cloud admin in order to get access to the dashboards so that you can see all the PaaS and IaaS that you have um, and like take list of all of those apps. And for code repo scanning, like, you know, every code repo, that's an app and either it's in prod or it's not, right? And so checking all of those to see which ones are in prod and that you should be paying attention to. But if you don't know about it, it's very likely not in a pipeline, right? And then it's very likely not getting security attention. And so these are all things you can do without touching the pipeline or bothering the devs or bothering the ops people. Okay, so another like goal that I always have is I want to find bugs, right? And I want to find security bugs, dev, ops, and QA, they want to find bugs that can like mess with the quality of their application, the customer experience, uh, the reliability and uh, resilience of their app. But we usually want to look for security things and we want to look in written code, running code, and third party code. So the old way we used to do this would be like manual code review. We would do a static application security scanning outside of a pipeline, running a DAST manually, occasionally, manually reviewing of third party components. And that like mostly what I saw is just people, they hire a pen tester at the very end of a giant waterfall project, or even if they're using a pipeline, but they're still actually doing waterfall. They hire a pen tester at the end there's very little time left, so they only fix one or two things and then they just push out to prod anyway. There's newer, better ways that we can do things where we can find all the bugs. So we can test in real time as the application's being used. So when you send it to those user acceptance testing people, the QA people that crawl all over it, you could have an I asked, an interactive application security testing tool inside the app, finding bugs for you, not in a pipeline. You could be scanning your third-party components in the pipeline if you want to, but you could also scan on check-in to the code repository, and then you could just scan your whole repo weekly to see if any new vulnerabilities have been found in components or libraries you've been using for months or years. You could run DAST on an automated schedule. It doesn't have to be in a pipeline. You could have it run every Friday night and email your reports or have it all go automatically into a vulnerability management system and just have it cut tickets for you into JIRA or whatever the name of your bug tracker is. Um, 
because there are some people that don't use Jira and that's okay. So all of these things are like amazing ways to find lots of security bugs and you don't have to mess with anyone's pipeline. Knowledge to fix the bugs that you have found. So this is the third way of DevOps, right? We wanna increase, like if you want developers to write secure code, you gotta give them knowledge of how to write it so they don't make bugs in the first place, but then you also have to teach them if we do find bugs, you know, this is what the report means, this is what the output from the tool means, and this is how you find answers and are able to fix these things and even retest it yourself. So knowledge. Yeah, so this is the third way through and through. I am a big fan, if you're going to decide what to teach your devs, there's certain standard things you wanna teach them, but I am a huge fan of data. I'm gonna talk more about data in this talk because I love data. And if you you know, can take all the different reports from all your different tools and mash them into the same system, whether that's Microsoft Excel, Power BI, or like a fancy system made for this, like Defect, Dojo, ThreadFix, Zero North, Cloud Defense, one of those, and then you can see trends. You can see, oh my gosh, no one's using any of those security headers we asked them to use. Everyone's got cross-site scripting. This one team has all this injection vulnerabilities and it makes me want to cry, but you can't see that without the data. Um, another thing you could do is you could start a security champions program, which I talk about constantly, so that you can scale these efforts even bigger. And the point is, is you don't need a pipeline at all. There's no pipeline required in order to do this. And you are helping dev and ops create secure systems and support them in secure ways. Okay, so education, which is different than knowledge. So developer education. So give them reference materials. So I realize I'm wicked biased, but give them my book. Um, if they're like a Java programmer, give them a secure coding in Java book, right? And like if they're a security architect, give them secure design books. Uh, get, like any sort of reference material, or if you could give them training, you could start an advocacy program where basically like, well, I, I could explain, but I have a whole talk about advocacy. But the idea is, is like changing the culture around it, especially through education. You could create a security champions program and then have train them even more than everyone else so that they can answer the questions when you're not there. You can have lunch and learns. I like, I know that the, right now there's the pandemic and like being near other humans is like, pretty dangerous at times, but like hopefully soon that's gonna be over and then you can do what I do where you buy a bunch of pizzas and they smell super delicious and then you open them and you walk through all the devs and you tell them we're having lunch and learn about security, mm, pizza please come. And then when I was a dev, I would just like show up to, I'm like, oh, you had pizza so I thought you wanted me here. And, or like sugar and carbs, those help too. But anyway, I'm not above bribery. Um, another thing that I have done, like with, cause I, so I was a senior dev for quite a while is I would, I would ask management for like learning blocks. So I'm like, can we have two hours a week to learn and improve our daily work? And so sometimes that would mean refactoring something. Sometimes that would mean, you know, doing two hours in this on-demand course that I've been doing for like a whole month because I only do two hours a week. Right. And, but you gotta put it in your learning calendar. You actually gotta block that time off or someone always books a meeting. But this whole thing around educating your developers, educating your operations folks, you don't need a pipeline to do it, but it definitely supports DevSecOps. Um, I also love giving security tools to the people who I am evaluating with those tools. So if I can afford it, like giving them a DAST or a SAS and saying, hey, like, Pew pew, please scan your app in this safe sandbox area I've given you. Like here's a video or here's some lessons I made about how to use it. And I want you to scan your app with this before it comes to me because, uh, <laughs> because I don't want really simple, obvious things to actually even get checked into the pipeline. Like fix it yourself first. By the time we go to the pipeline or by the time a pen tester comes or a manual security tester has time to look at it, they're actually working really hard to earn their paycheck instead of just 
it's really obvious low-hanging fruit that you've left for them. If you are creating unit tests for your code, you can copy those and make a second copy. So don't change your original ones. Make negative unit tests. So do regressive security testing by adding payloads into them. This is, again, a thing that developers could be the boss of and like manage, but you can encourage them. You can teach them how you can help by giving them tons of payloads of things to just shove into various unit tests so that they can verify that their app always fails gracefully and rejects bad data. Another thing is just scanning the code repo. So like lots and lots of devs I talk to, they there's certain tools that they really like and they'll scan their own repo. They'll hook it up and do this or that. And if you see some of them doing it, encourage them and see if you can get the rest of them to do it and see if you can get access to those actual results. Um, a thing that I've seen that is pushing very far left are IDE plugins and hooks. So there are tons of plugins that help with your code quality and your the security of your code as you're writing. And it's just, I've heard really good results with a lot of those. Um, you can give your devs a software composition analysis tool so that, again, they can scan their own code repo or a local copy of the code. It looks at all the components and libraries and just tells them like, hey, this one, uh, it's pretty frightening. There's a bunch of known vulnerabilities in it. You know, we would like you to upgrade to version X. So all of these things are pushing left. It still works in line with the whole DevOps philosophy, all the pro projects and processes that they're doing, it works with it, but you don't have to put these tools in the pipeline to get good results. It's nice, but you don't have to at all. Um, a secure system development life cycle. So an application security program is sometimes known as a secure system development life cycle. Basically, it means one or more security activities during every phase of the SDLC. So when you are doing requirements, um, have a set of standardized security requirements for software projects, for API projects, for serverless projects. It's like, if you're gonna do an API, if it's public facing, it absolutely must be accessible only via an API gateway. This is the one we use. These are the settings we require, boom. And then they know what you want from the beginning. Having a secure coding guideline, teaching them the guideline, have reference materials and code samples ready, review and respect secure design principles when in the design phase, threat modeling in the design phase, pen test and testing phase. I realize like testing in the testing phase makes a lot of sense, but the possibilities are endless of adding, they're probably not endless, but adding different security features. Even if you're doing DevOps, you still need requirements. You still end up doing design. It doesn't magically alleviate that. You still have to do them, it's just different. Um, you can assign an application security resource, so by that I mean a person, to a project team. And basically they're a point of contact throughout the entire project. And it's like, oh yeah, Tanya's our AppSec, um, you know, she's our partner in this project. And so when we have questions, she helps us. If we you know, need to hire a consultant, she helps us. She makes sure that the security of our project is on track. You can have, yeah, pen testers do not operate inside the pipeline unless you have a very interesting scope for your project. Um, a more advanced thing that you could do would be chaos engineering or red teaming, which definitely should be happening outside the pipeline. For the deployment or like maintenance phase of the system development life cycle, monitoring, alerting, and logging does not happen inside a pipeline but gosh darn, is it ever important? <laughs> if you have an app that's being attacked all the time and you don't know, life is very bad. Incident responders generally aren't touching a pipeline. You could do a sprint. So let's say you're doing two week sprints of work. You could have a security sprint where all you do is fix security bugs or all you do is have like intensive security testing. Again, we don't need to add 50 tools to a pipeline to accomplish any of this but we're still practicing the principles and not at all breaking the processes of the DevOps people. We are supporting them the whole time. Tools that live outside the pipeline. 
So a big purpose of many AppSec programs is to implement useful and effective tooling. So if you don't have any tools, your life's gonna be kinda crappy as an AppSec professional. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. But what, you, what we want is we want accurate results, we want good coverage, we want valuable feedback. Those are things that I require. So if it's like 90% false positives, I'm like, I don't know if I need this tool, or if it has 90% false negatives where it's telling me everything's fine, I found nothing. I, I used to have a tool like that where it would just tell me every API was perfect and I'm like, trust me, it's not. I know it's not. And it would scan and be like, A plus, and it was not A plus. So that's also bad. So tools that do not need to go into a pipeline, right? So these are the types of things that absolutely cannot go into a pipeline. So false negatives. If you have a broken build for not a good reason, that makes devs cranky. It makes me cranky, to be quite honest. So for instance, if you're doing static application security testing on your entire code base, that should never go in a pipeline. It's gonna to take too long. It's gonna be super inaccurate. Long pipeline times. So if there is a tool that takes a really long time to run, so let's say you're gonna use a dynamic application security testing tool and you haven't tuned it, you haven't set the scope, it's sitting there crawling your app forever, especially if your app has dynamic pages, disaster. Um, continuous scanning can be more accurate than that. So by continuous scanning, I mean have a scan set up every 24 hours and it goes on a schedule and it's not in the pipeline and then it just sends you if there's results that have changed. You can do DNS-based scanning, so just within a certain area. You can have an agent, so for instance, um, like Nessus and Nexpos and like a lot of those VA, automated VA products, like you can just have agents installed all across everywhere. Microsoft has that too with their security center. You could just have all these agents and they just like, they're like, yeah, I scanned it again and this is wrong now. I scanned it again and this config was changed and I'm concerned. You can scan your code repo all day long. It's not gonna bug anyone, but it will give you a lot of results. Another thing you can do, so we talk a lot about, I'm like looking at my slides and trying to decide how much to say on each one because I want to do every single slide, but I also want to talk a lot. <sighs> okay, so mostly when we talk about pipelines, we're missing the word release. So CI, CD, pipeline, whenever we're talking about it, 90% of the time we mean that it releases to various environments and it releases eventually to production. And that is the super important pipeline where you don't wanna break the build for no reason. However, you can also have an asynchronous pipeline. So you can just, you can have two and one is the real one that goes to dev, releases code to dev, tests things on dev, tests things on QA, etc. And then it eventually goes out to production. And if you break the build, people are unhappy with you. Unless you caught a real bug, then they're like, good job. But you can have another pipeline right above it or below it that gets kicked off on whatever reason. So it could be with major releases. It could be every Friday. And it could just run a ton of super slow tests. And it doesn't release anything. All it does is run the tests, make the report, and that's it. It doesn't stop anything or anyone and then you go through wade through those results and then give them real results like this is broken this is broken this needs some fixing these 400 bugs are false positives etc and so that is an option as well and that is in a pipeline and I know I said I was going to talk about things that aren't in a pipeline but I just wanted to put the idea in your head that not every pipeline has to release anywhere incident response so this is a goal I have for every AppSec program. I want trained incident response team that understands AppSec. I want them to know when to call me or better yet, if they could respond to it without my help. I find incidents super fascinating, super exciting and also ridiculously stressful. I'm really good at getting excited and I'm really bad at coming back down. And so I'm a little agitated and I can't sleep and I just like dream about the incident. And although that makes for good work, uh, it doesn't make for good life. So I don't do incident response full time anymore, <laughs> even though I really like it. 
but you don't need uh, you don't need to do anything to do with the pipeline to have a really well trained apps uh, incident response team. So like, I would want to you know create an incident response process, tell everyone about it, give them my inventory, show them where my code repo is, give them access to all my tools. You know, perform blameless postmortems. That's really important if you want to have a good instant response team. Give them training once a year. All those things, there's no pipeline required for any of that. But they are the people that respond when there's an emergency. And so, like, you can reach this extremely important goal for your security program. No need to bother those DevOps people. Um, a bonus for this is implementing tools to prevent or detect application security incidents. I know I talk a lot about incident response even though I try not to do it. I haven't done an incident since February. Boom. Because <laughs> if clients call, I still go help. Um, but basically, incident response does not require pipelines. I'm just gonna continue on. Uh, the next, I told you I was gonna talk more about data. So when we think about the third way of DevOps, continuously, Continuous improvement, right? Spending time to improve your daily work, continuous learning. So we can improve our program based on metrics, experimentation, and feedback from any and all stakeholders, right? All the feedback we get is important and helps us do a better job. And so every three months, we can review all the results from our tools, like just like mash that stuff into Excel. If you don't have a nice system for it, it's okay. And just like literally just do some sorting and you're like, yeah, we have a big problem with this. And then attack it, right? You can take all the information from your incident post-mortem reports and then take information from stakeholders and combine that to improve your plans and your AppSec program. You can experiment to find better ways to reach your goals. Or let's say you're doing a proof of concept of three different tools, but they're the same type of tool. You know, which one's finding the most bugs? Which one has the most accurate results? Which one runs the fastest? And which ones are the devs not allergic to? <laughs> um, yeah, proof of concepting, new tools. Yeah, yeah. So another metrics thing you can do is you can visit other AppSec shops to learn from them if possible. There are lots of different security teams that actually share information live. Um, sorry, I just got a note about time and I'm working on it. Um, <laughs> but basically like companies like Netflix, um, Segment, there's like a, a bunch of companies out there where they're sharing really helpful information about how they do things and what worked and what didn't work. And I feel honestly super grateful to companies that do that because a lot of people just keep it all a secret and then how can we all learn and move forward as an industry if all we do is keep secrets i think it's really brave to share especially if you're you know we tried this and it blew up in our faces and here's why <laughs> and then we did that and that worked better i consider it really uh, very good and um i give them accolades you can follow industry leaders in this area to learn more, attend and sit in on talks like this one. You can form relationships with other areas of IT in order to find ways to work better together. And this is part of the third way of DevOps, working to improve your daily work. You wanna improve the daily work of everyone in your org as it relates to security. Right? Like if you find out there's this security feature that you've turned on that's like annoying the crap out of everyone you work with and they're always trying to find ways around it, that is a thing that you want to work on when you are working to improve your daily work. When you are doing continuous learning, you're learning that that's not working and that you need to change. And all of this feeds into the, the goals and the basically the reason that DevOps exists. So I have a summary for you. And then I have a bunch of free resources and then we have a short time for question and answer. And if I don't answer your questions here, I can answer them on Twitter. So summary. So we learned about a lot of different goals that we could set for an AppSec program and how we could accomplish them without messing up the pipelines. We learned that AppSec or application security is not just one tool or one tactic. We can be flexible to get the goals that we want. 
It just matters the impact that we have, not that we have to do it this way or that way. And DevOps is not just pipelines. There's so much more to doing all of DevOps, changing the culture, changing the way people think and the way people do things, changing our processes. It is not just tools. And so with that, I'm gonna give you some free, I'm gonna give you resources, but the books are not free. So these are some of my favorite books, including my book. So I'm super biased, but I think my book's really great. And my mom told me she liked it too, but I know she didn't read it. Um, Cause my mom is a mathematician chemist and she's very bright, but I don't think she cares at all about application security. <laughs> if you are a woman or a non-binary person, um, I helped found this organization, WOSEC Women of Security, and we have chapters all over the world, including, I don't think we have one in Pittsburgh, but I don't even know if we have one in LA. We have one in Palo Alto, I believe though. Anyway, uh, I have an online community for We Hack Purple and it's free. And so you can chat with people, meet people, talk to people. There's like a couple hundred articles in there. So you could search it like a knowledge base ask questions, there's events, and most of them are free. And the idea is, is uh, I just want a fun place to hang out. <laughs> Every Monday on Twitter, I do Cyber Mentoring Monday, and I help people connect so that they can find professional mentors. If you want to give back to our industry, this is a great way to do it. You will make someone's entire year if you have like a couple coffees with them and just help them understand what direction they need or tell them, you know, this book really helped me and here's some videos and like call me if you need help. It makes such a huge difference in someone's life. And then the last resource that I'm gonna give you is me. So I'm she Hacks Purple on Twitter and actually like every single platform. Um, I, there's alisonboblearn.com. We have monthly free live streams where um, I have other experts on and we talk about each chapter of the book and that's free. I have a blog, um, I have YouTube, I have like all the stuff. I'm a dweeb on the internet, that's part of the deal. And so with that, I would like to say thank you so much for your time and attention today. I went one minute over, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hope that's okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you so much, Tanya. It was a great talk, excellent talk. I mean, if if we have more time, I'm sure we can take like a couple hours to discuss and talk. <laughs> great, great talk and great information that you shared. So I have a couple follow-up questions just to open up a little bit topic here. I know we have a lot to ask, but I'm gonna ask one specific question. And I have been running a DevSecOps survey for years. And when I asked the question to developers, and why you're not implementing security or what is really blocking you to implement security in your daily life cycle? The 90% of developers are literally thinking about the time. They don't have enough time, which goes back to the, your first and second way of DevOps, like fast feedback emphasize efficiency of the system, entire system. Do you have any advice and tip? How can we solve that paradox? Like developers believe, but didn't have time but as a security folks, we're asking, do the better job, but something is missing. Something is not working right in this context, you know? Developer are believing, but they don't. What, how can so you change that there, perception? So there's sort of two different parts of this. And so one is like, you need management and project management support. So if the manager is like, I don't care, do these features, the dev's gonna do the features. Right? If the project manager has made a super tight schedule and there's zero time to do any security activities, like the devs aren't gonna work every weekend for a thing that's not tight on their schedule. So you need management to be on board with the fact that there's gonna be, let's say like a two week security sprint where all you're gonna do is fix security bugs. So the devs actually have time. But the other side of that is at the beginning is trying to trying to figure out a way so that they don't have as many bugs at the end. So if let's say someone's doing an API, right? And they're like, I need to write an API, you know, I'm gonna do open API, great. Give them a tool that helps them make sure it's secure, that helps them define it properly. And so maybe it'll take ever so slightly longer the first time because they're using this tool. But um, I got a tool with one of the consulting places where I do stuff. And within 45 minutes, we had 
like really changed the definition and it was way more secure. And so then by the time it gets down the line, our input validation was super solid because we had done it as part of our definition. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So, absolutely. And so if, if you can support them from the very beginning and making sure things are way more secure, that like when I as a pen tester, I'm just gonna be super honest. I was, mm, I was okay. I was super junior and I would run a bunch of scans and like do some manual testing and then be like, voila, I found like 25 things because no one had looked at security before me. So I looked super smart, which is it's good as a consultant to look super smart. But then I started doing AppSec with my consulting, which is why I had to get a new job because my boss was like, stop doing that. But I, like, I, I would show up early and I would threat model and I would help them fix things. And I'd be like, yeah, your design, like, could we make this here and encrypt that? And then things will be better. And by the time I got to the end, I'm like, yeah, I only found like two little things. Could you fix it now? And then they had time because I'd done all the stuff before. And my boss was like, that's not your job. Your job is to obliterate them and like show our value. And I'm like, no, there's gotta be a better way. And then I found out you can have full-time job doing that. And it's called AppSec. That's a great summary, actually. It's a great point that you laid out, Tanya. It's outside the pipeline that what we discuss. It is a manager, it's a culture, it's a belief, it's a mindset. Thank you so much for your participation. It was a variable talk. And then we'll, I am sure we have a lot of questions. We'll follow up with you or through the YouTube channel okay. as well. We'll follow up with you. Thank you so much, Tanya, for yes. your time. So thank as you we are heading to me. the thank you, as we are heading to the break, and we're gonna have another talk in shortly, and we will be talking about AppSec maturity with respect to the metrics and DevSecOps, which is a, a great continuation of our discussion that we discuss right now. We will continue here about the metrics, and then we're talking to talk about how can we do the DevSecOps metrics in the pipeline perspective. That said, and our next speaker will be a Shrash Khandra after the break.
Welcome back, everybody. Uh, next up, we have a, a presentation from Shura Chandra Bose, um, who is an associate director at Cognizant Business Consulting. Um, he's going to be uh, give a, a talk about um, enhancing AppSec maturity and outcomes using DevSecOp metrics. And enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Greetings to you all. This is Suresh Chandra Bose, and I'm very excited to be speaking about how we can enhance the AppSec maturity and outcomes using DevSecOps metrics. A little brief uh, introduction about me. I'm based out of Austin, Texas, and I work for Cognizant Digital Business Consulting. With 23 years of IT experience, I have been a speaker in 15 plus leading conferences like DevOps Days, ASTQB, PNSQC, ASQ, Docker's Community with JFrog, A.8 Computer Security Conference, and I'm really excited to be speaking here at DevSecOps Days. Before uh, diving into the key measures for every CISO to monitor and track the effectiveness of app security maturity, let's see what is DevSecOps. There are multiple ways one can define this. DevSecOps is a way of approaching the IT security with and everyone is responsible for security mindset. It involves injecting security practices into organization's DevOps pipeline, right? If your client is already into DevOps, then it is a very good idea to consider shifting towards DevSecOps, right? All right, why DevSecOps? So this is a result of a recent survey conducted by Synopsys, who's a leader in Gartner's Magic Quadrant for application security testing. Looking at the results, very limited focus is given to DevSecOps model, DevSecOps tool adoption, right? And hence the need to increase investments in various tool set to have a secure product is very huge. Okay? Most of you might be using your Apple or Android phones. More than 85% of the applications from public app stores, like uh, the Apple Store or the Google Play, they violate one or more of the top 10 vulnerabilities which has been identified by OS. So that shows even our mobile phones are prone to attacks and hence the importance of DevSecOps is even more prominent today. In fact, there are four key aspects of the continuous delivery pipeline, right? So if you see here, this is a safe continuous delivery pipeline. You have your continuous exploration, which focuses on creating alignment of what needs to be built, right? Then you have your continuous integration, which focus on taking your features from the backlog, program backlog, and then start implementing them. And you have your continuous deployment, which takes the changes from your staging environment and deploys them to the production environment where they're ready for release. Then you have the last element, which is the release on demand. It is basically uh, making available to all the customers at once, or you're going to release it in a staggered fashion based on <clears throat> the market or the business needs. Right. So let's see how security is embedded to all of these four pillars. Let's start with continuous exploration. Right. So as organizations become more digital, more cloud-based, IT systems face increased risk, increased vulnerability, right? and hence threat modeling is adopted here in CE. It's a process in the early phase of your uh, pipeline to identify your threat and also mitigate them with a structured model. It helps you to identify your security requirements, pinpoint security threats, pinpoint your potential vulnerabilities. Right? You'll be able to quantify your threat and your vulnerability criticality, and then you'll be able to prioritize the remediation steps to mitigate them. Right? In fact, uh, there are four uh, basic steps in threat modeling. Right? You typically study the data flow transactions, your architecture diagrams, your data classifications to know what you're building. So that's step number one. Then you will find out what could go wrong. And there are various modeling methods that have been used here. Step two, right? Then step three, you take some actions using security controls. 
and then as a final step you start validating them um, have you acted on all the three steps that we have seen right so those are the four steps that have been used and a lot of organizations consulting companies have yeah started using threat modeling as a service to various clients security in continuous integration okay. in fact this is a very critical element because the actual development happens here so security is heavily built into this ci pillar right. let's go through one by one um, security id plugins they give the developers direct feedback why uh, with with in, in fact with analysis when you start writing your code even before it is checked in right there are various good uh, tools plugins available like eclipse or uh, intellij intel intellij right. then you have your code reviews where it is able to ascertain um, your code qualities right and based on the patterns from the different code reviews you can automate rules in say the code analyzer you have your pair work which uses your extreme programming which provides real time feedback directly during your design or coding where you can temporarily pair the team with a security expert you have your sas which is the white box testing or some call it as static application security testing where there are sas tools which scans your source code right and it will be able to identify your potential vulnerabilities in your software and in your architecture in fact sas is a very critical element of your devsecops because this identifies almost 50% of your existing security vulnerabilities and there are a lot of tools out in the market you have your cast sonar cube and there are other popular tools as well then you do your third party scan where your third party library or component which will be scanned by your static code analysis um, you have your first testing right where you randomly feed invalid or unexpected inputs and data to find any uh, coding errors or security loopholes now once your code is ready to be shipped it can be code signed where you put a digital signature on a program or a file so its authenticity and integrity can be verified upon installation and execution um, you have your infrastructure scans that will assess your security levels of your infrastructure it includes your malware in the application servers databases open ports right and even outdated components like your old ssl your smtp your dns versions right then you do your malware scans for your sas infrastructure before you package any component right finally if you see the last element in the continuous integration you have your dynamic scans which is we we call it as dast or the dynamic application security testing which is also known as black box testing right so this is done uh, typically without the access to the code unlike uh, sas where you have the, the code which has been um, sent as an input right so the goal here is to identify potential vulnerabilities where it's you typically the 50% gets missed by sas and the remaining 50% is for the das to uh, detect the key element here is penetration testing it is also called ethical hacking right so unlike sas and das penetration testing it not only focuses on your code or your software but it covers components of your system it includes your hardware it includes your operating system it includes your software as well it also includes any vulnerability from the human components as well okay. then you have your release on demand continuous security monitoring uh, is widely used here uh, which basically monitors your system and again it uses automation to find any potential security breaches right this is usually done by a security information and even management system where you have your security incidents which are locked and the security response team they gather the information about the newly discovered vulnerabilities and they feed this information back to the development and to the operations team you have your application providers uh, they usually issue a security bulletin to inform the customers about the newly 
found vulnerabilities and they take uh, necessary actions measures to mitigate or fix them so if you see here everything has to be automated here with shifter practices for higher efficiency and uh, higher effectiveness okay. you have to create security champions who are part of your existing team or you release train then train your developers on security but make sure they don't burden them to become security experts and perform threat modeling which is earlier as part of your continuous exploration much much early before you start doing your build and implement strong version control on all code and code components focus first on identifying and removing known open source vulnerabilities and if you see i have a nikon here white source right because they are the number one leader in this particular space all right next is going to be the key element of this presentation right we're going to see the key metrics there are six key metrics which every caso must track to ensure dev secops is working successfully or not right let's go in detail because this is very important um, to see the implementation of your dev secops pipeline is it effective or not right so the first is reduce total security tickets open right? so if the count of your security related uh, tickets that are open or coming down then your dev secops practices and your tools for your dev secops they are working well so that is going to be the number one uh, matrix the second is reduce time to deploy right so we have seen the threat modeling you have seen lot of uh, security shift left practices right security shift left practices so with these elements you are able to identify you are able to fix your security defects much much early in the game right because you are able to fix those defects early you are able to reduce the time to deploy so time to deploy has to gradually come down so reduce time to deploy is number the, the number second metrics that we want to track right so third is discovery of pre prod vulnerabilities so by pre prod uh, vulnerabilities what i mean is this is very similar to your dre or the defect removal efficiency some companies call it defect containment where you try to contain maximum defects maximum vulnerabilities in the pre production right so you're not getting so you're making sure that those defects or those vulnerabilities are not getting leaked onto the production if it goes to the production then i think there is going to be a heavy amount of rework that is involved so that's why this matrix will be uh, able to tell you to what extent you are able to detect the defects in vulnerabilities in the pre prod so ideally this discovery of the pre prod vulnerability has to be 100% right and again the best in class metrics is somewhere around 95% uh, where they operate at 95% to 98% the fourth is going to be the reduced time to remediate right so as you saw earlier we have strong collaboration among all the team members you have shared responsibilities of the devsecops team right so you should be in a position to remediate all the security related defects much faster and with less amount of time so the time to remediate any defect any vulnerability has to gradually come down has to reduce the fifth metrics is going to be the percent of security audits passed right so if the security audit is not pass then it reflects very badly on the entire team right though the chief information security officer he will be accountable at the organization level the entire team is responsible right so that's why i told you security in devsecops is everyone's responsibility so this metric should continually improve to close to very close to 100% so we don't want any audit not to be uh, missed right ideally every security audit has to be 100% passed 
there has to be no failure in this particular matrix at all. Right? The last but not the least is reducing failed security test. So when a release gets rejected, it could be because of a security failure, right? So what happens is it impacts every other metrics that we saw earlier. So it comes with serious consequences. You miss the time to deliver, right? So what happens when you miss the time to deliver? So the development, the developers, they will have to rewrite the code. So when they start rewriting the code and when they start, uh, what happens is again, they, they have to fix it, right? They have to identify the potential vulnerabilities. So the, 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 the reduction in the security failed builds, this, so this is going to be an important matrix to make sure you deliver a safe product, you, you are able to deliver a better product. So in just, I think these are the core six metrics which every organization has to potentially have uh, to make sure that your implementation of DevSecOps pipeline is successful or not. Right? Well, uh, there are some outcomes uh, that can be achieved by implementing these um, DevSecOps practices. Right? Let's have a quick look at those uh, business outcomes. If you see here, faster delivery. The speed of a software delivery is obviously improved when security is integrated into the pipeline. So faster delivery is going to be a key benefit, key business outcome. Right? Second is going to be your improved security posture. Okay. So with all the shared responsibility mindset, okay, you can see an improved security posture with, um, with all strong collaboration between the developers, between the, among the developers, the operations team, the testers, and the business team as well. Overall, the, everyone talks about security they know what is security in and out, right? How to deal with security. So ideally the security posture of the entire organization improves. So that's the second business outcome. Okay. The third is the value of DevOps itself is enhanced with all the integration of the security practices, right? Secu with the security practices built into the DevOps pipeline, DevOps value chain, right? The overall DevOps, value or the value is enhanced. And so it's the third business outcome. And again, fourth, you are able to identify your vulnerabilities, the bugs before you deploy into the production, before you deploy um, uh, in, um, it could be maybe based on the release need, based on the release on demand needs, right? So what typically happens is you can see the, the cost, the operational cost coming down. You can see the reduction in the risk coming down, right? So overall, the cost gets reduced drastically. That's then very important, obviously an important benefit, reduction in cost, okay? Then your security, um, pace, the, the pace at which, I mean, it improves the security integration and the pace, the pace at which you operate, right? I told you security is tightly integrated here. When security is tightly integrated, you, you'll be able to see more agility here. And you can see the improvement at the pace at which the applications are delivered. You'll be able to deliver more applications into the production. In, you're able to release more at much faster race, pace. Last but not the least, uh, enabling greater overall business success. Right? So with a greater trust in the security of your developed software and embracing new technologies, you will be able to succeed in meeting your business objectives, in meeting your business goals. Right? So that's a very key business outcome. The customer is happy, business is happy, right? So the entire team is happy, They're able to succeed. And with all these outcomes, your customer satisfaction survey, the CSAT improves, right? Your NPS improves. So those are the six key outcomes that you are able to successfully meet. Right? 
So let me summarize my presentation. We saw what is DevSecOps. We saw why is it needed. We saw what are the different aspects of continuous delivery pipeline and how security can be injected into each of those areas within the pipeline. Okay. Then we saw the six key metrics, how we can measure DevSecOps implementation using those six key metrics. And what are the key business outcomes and benefits that one can derive from implementing these DevSecOps practices. So you can feel free to contact me either to my email or to my LinkedIn. In case if you have any further clarifications, you can always reach out to me anytime, even after uh, this presentation. Right? So finally, a big thank you to everyone and uh, I'm really happy to be here in your midst. So if there are any further questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I'll be happy to answer uh, any queries or any clarification that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Suresh. That was a great presentation. Um, I wanted to um, discuss a few things with you. We actually have, we also have some questions coming in from the, from the chat on the stream. Um, but one thing I found extremely interesting was how you defined a DevSecOps pillar, um, continuous exploration, which is a very interesting concept. Um, and within that, you mentioned threat modeling, which is another, well, it's a, it's a big concept in, in DevSecOps. Um, what I'm interested in knowing more about is how do you, I guess with threat modeling, I see it as like a compliance thing almost. How do you gather information from other stages um, do you consider, like for example, your your um, your your metrics and how that affects the threat model? Meaning, do you feed those back into the threat model to kind of get like a go or no go kind of metric? All right. So as you rightly said, uh, continuous uh, exploration, it's a very key element, right? So during continuous exploration, you can see there's a lot of new ideas that are raised it gets refined, it gets prepared as part of the prioritized features in the part, uh, features which, which gets into the program backlog, right? So this is a very, very critical element. Um, so this is where the entire alignment, right? That that gets built, right? So that's why, I mean, we, we, we just have to focus on the metrics right from continuous exploration. So we cannot ignore continuous exploration and focus only on the other elements within the pipeline. So, so that's why I mean it's like shifting left. Security has to be shifting left, but at the same time, shift, security has to be embedded everywhere across, right? So we have to start tracking the key metrics using, uh, I think one of the key steps that we talked about, right? That modeling, right? Where we start uh, identifying your security requirements, pinpoint your security threats and quantify threats and start coming up with some remediation steps. So the metrics uh, tracking is, obviously going to start right from continuous exploration. Yes. Thank you. So yeah, a few questions from, from the YouTube chat. Um, what are the metrics that can potentially, that will potentially come from a SAS tool? Metrics coming up from a SAS tool. Okay, so that's uh, that's a good question. Right? So in fact, metrics not only comes from SAS tool, but from other areas as well. But let me quickly, the very key important metrics that comes from the SAS is the code quality, right? So that's a very, important metrics which focuses on different parameters. It's related to your bugs, it relates to your anti-patterns, refactoring your uh, poor coding practices, potential vulnerabilities, right? And there are various other measures like reliability, like uh, releasability, security vulnerabilities, security review on code smell, right? Which focuses on the maintainability related issues within the code. So these are the potential uh, focus areas of metrics which comes from the SAS. Okay. And another question, um, are there popular DAS tools that can help scan our application? Yeah, in fact, one in from one of my recent uh, client experience, I've seen um, clients using WebInspect, which is from the HP MicroFocus and Burp Suit from uh, Portsvigar. So these are popular tools. In fact, we have other tools like NetSparker. In fact, uh, Veracode is, uh, is a very, um, a popular company which provides robust end-to-end -end AppSec governance. Uh, they, they do it both for SAST as well as DAS. For SAS, they call it Veracode Static Analysis. For uh, DAS, they have Veracode uh, Dynamic Analysis. 
Okay. And I guess that's, that's a good segue to, to something I'll ask is what kind of tools do you use for an infrastructure scan? Infrastructure scan. Um, again, I mean, we have not, again, from a, my personal experience, we have not used it, but there are widely available tools out in the market. Okay. So thank you again. That was a great presentation. Um, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, so with that said, thank you, Suresh, for the great presentation. Um, we're going to head to a break and we'll be back. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff.
Hello, everyone. We are the last speaker of a day, and Arun is going to be with us shortly. And Arun is a senior DevSecOps consultant and is practicing at the Security Campus. He has a distinctive and resourceful experience in secure system development lifecycle activities, including secure design, threat modeling, vulnerability management, and the solution across different domains and platforms. He has a keen interest on transformative technologies like machine learning, blockchain, and Internet of the Things. Arun is also a certified practitioner and has experience working as a product security architect for product and consulting firms as well. And he's going to talk about achieving a continuous compliance in DevOps program and how can we achieve the continuous compliances? How can we align with our DevSecOps principles? How it can be done? Arun, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hassan, Elaine, Michelle, and the entire team of DevSecOps Days, including the organizing committee. You all have been doing a fabulous job by bringing together the practitioners having similar interests. And thank you again for giving me an opportunity to share my perspective. Hello and my greetings to all attendees of this event. We have an interesting topic to talk about for the next 30 minutes on continuous compliance in DevOps. A topic certainly of a lot of interest to DevOps practitioners. I would like to kick off uh, this presentation with a brief introduction about myself before we jump into our topic. Uh, I'm Arun Prabhakar. I'm a product security architect and also a DevSecOps consultant. I'm also a security data scientist with a primary focus on threat science and threat intelligence and learning other concepts every day to do better and contribute more in the space. I have 14 years of experience in information security, primarily application security, and focusing more into threat models and vulnerability management. Well, that's something quick about me. Now let's get into our topic. I thought it would be a good way to begin by making our intentions and objectives clear and importantly, understanding the definitions so that we are all in the same line of thought. At first, security and compliance. There might be a slight overlap when security and compliance are used in the same context, but in general, security is the practice of implementing an effective solution to a set of security issues and compliance is the application of the security practice to satisfy the regulatory requirements. And the reason why I'm particularly talking about this basic definition is because we are going to see throughout this presentation on how security concepts are going to be applied and leveraged for accomplishing the compliance tasks. Okay, so what are these compliance goals? It's all about focusing on addressing the mandatory regulations, making sure internal policies are being addressed and of course, adhering to the recommended standards and even the best practices that are applicable. That's at a high level, the goals of the compliance. Now, we jump into a key concept called continuous compliance. And to understand this, uh, if you see compliance is not certainly a one-time effort, but instead is going to be an ongoing process in product development where the features are going to be developed in an incremental fashion. And there are going to be periodic releases right? And with each release, you got to make sure the product is compliant and adhering to all the mandatory regulations and standards. So that way, the compliance is going to be a continuous process and with each release and at each stage of the product lifecycle. All right, so what is compliance as code? We talked about continuous compliance, but let's keep in mind that this continuous compliance is not a one person's job or a one team's job. Compliance will have to be built in in the product right from the initial stages. And most importantly, the concepts will have to be implemented at every phase. I mean, the implementation logic will have to be programmed in every phase, be it the design, the testing, or the deployment, um, or, um, or in any of the phases of DevOps, if you see the implementation logic will have to be programmed in every phase, right? Uh, so we are primarily trying to codify all these security concepts throughout this life cycle. Now, this is how it is done in DevOps and we refer to it as compliance as code. We will study this with more details in the following slides. That is with regards to all the definitions and the definitions are clear now, we will see how to accomplish this continuous compliance in DevOps. There are two important areas to focus here. Number one, how to implement the security concepts. And number two, how to organizing the security teams. 
when it comes to implementing the security concepts, we all saw that compliance is the application of security practice to meet the regulatory requirements. But how does these security concepts get implemented in the DevOps pipeline? So that's where we will learn on how all these authentication, authorization in the pipeline are implemented at each stage. Secondly, how to organize the security teams. Security team organization is very important so that the appropriate security tasks are going to be handled by the right security teams. And yes, we'll be able to establish accountability of actions. All right, so before we get into the whole part of accomplishing our objectives, let's understand a bit about how security is going to fit in the DevOps pipeline. Now, we are all familiar with this infinity figure. It shows us the different phases of the DevOps lifecycle. Now, since there are so many security tasks that are going to be addressed in the DevOps pipeline, we will define the different categories of security. And we will place each of these security tasks under the category defined, and that way it will be easier for us to understand about how security fits in the overall pipeline. And here we go with the different categories, security in the pipeline, security for the pipeline, and security of the pipeline. Security in the pipeline, this is the segment that talks about how all the security concepts are going to be built in the pipeline. That is how all the security requirements would be implemented or codified throughout the pipeline. Security for the pipeline, this is the segment that will be helpful in defining the security assessments or activities for making the pipeline's security risk posture better. And finally, the security of the pipeline. In this segment, we discuss about what security aspects need to be implemented for all the infrastructure components of the DevOps pipeline. So the security of the infrastructure will be the focus here. We will see how this comes into action. With regards to security of the pipeline, as I told you before, the security of the infrastructure components of the DevOps pipeline will be the focus. And it will deal with the following that you see here. The security of repository where your application code and the data resides. The security of orchestration platforms used throughout the DevOps lifecycle. The security of the third party integration and so on. From a responsibility perspective, it is on the owners of your SecOps team most of the time with some assistance from the dev and QA teams. Now with regards to security for the pipeline, following are the activities that come under this. All these activities are done by a security architect or by a security expert most of the time, again with some involvement from the dev team. They are all done for securing the different phases or the different parts of the pipeline not getting into the details of every security activity and the outcome, but yes, threat models, periodic security activity, the risk management, the architecture security reviews are some of the important activities that will have to be done rigorously. And with regards to security in the pipeline, now this is the segment that helps in having all security concepts to be built into the pipeline. For example, how we build an authentication, how we build an authorization, how all these security concepts and principles are built in the pipeline. I mean, how they are going to be codified along with the application logic. That will be the focus of this segment. It is important to codify these security concepts throughout the various phases of the DevOps pipeline, right from the initial phases like planning and coding. All right, so lastly, there is a fourth element called security beyond the pipeline. Now this one is very specific to the leaders in your organization who manage the entire DevOps program. Um, yeah, so you know the, the activities that you typically deal with are the um, resourcing, budgeting, the cultural aspects of uh, the DevOps implementation and the infrastructure of the pipeline for your security program. All these are going to be the uh, major items that are going to be dealt over here. But as I said, this is more for the managers, but the other three segments are going to be for the people involved in the execution part of it. Once again, take a look at this complete picture. All these security categories, having different security tasks and the different, uh, different teams that are involved in the enterprises will have to come together in securing your DevOps projects. And this is exactly how we fit security in the DevOps pipeline. All right. So now we move on to accomplishing our objectives, how to implement the security concepts. 
In the previous slide, we learned about the different methods of fitting security in the pipeline, including the concept of security as a code. Now we will learn about how to achieve this, how to implement this, and that we will deal with in the following slide. All right, so here we will see how the security as a code should be implemented. The security concepts are going to be codified along with the application logic. At first, yes, write the logic to implement all your security principles, like planning your defensive layers, defining the least privilege mechanism, or implementing the logging mechanism using the authentication, authorization concepts, and so on. We also have to write the programming logic to integrate our application with a third-party security tool that validates the program code and prevents from security threats like your injection attacks or your malware attacks. Now, this act of writing security defenses in your application code is what I mean as codifying security. And as a first part of it, we have to codify all the security principles and the tools. Secondly, all the security requirements must also be codified. These security requirements for your applications are largely determined based on few important attributes. Uh, number one, the geography of deployment. For example, your CCPA regulatory requirements for products deployed in California, the requirements that are specific to the industry vertical, uh, for example, the PCI related requirements that are very specific to the financial organization. But the point is that all these regulatory requirements will have to be implemented and integrated with the application code right from the inception stages all the way to the final stages of the DevOps. And next, every phase of the product development uh, need to be need to follow this concept of security as a code. Be it the requirement, the design, the development, the testing phases, the deployment phases, the release phases of the DevOps, all these phases will have to be codified. They all have to be codified with the concepts of security concepts like authentication authorization, the different security tools. We are going to see in a short while the different security tools that are going to be um, involved in the DevOps pipeline. The security requirements, I just gave a couple of examples. So be it the concepts, tools, requirements, everything will have to be codified and that's something which is very important and that will have to be done for every phase. So basically it is uh, not just the development phase alone where the security concepts are codified, but also the other phases. And yes, this needs to happen continuously throughout the life cycle and it's just not going to be a one-time thing. Finally, the process steps involved in the security life cycle must also be codified because during the product life cycle, we are trying to manage a set of security tasks by using scripts with the intention of automating the DevOps process rather than using manual method. So the automation scripts developed play a major role in triggering the right security tools at the right time um, and as well as communicating to the stakeholders about the different kind of security issues in a continuous fashion. In fact, this kind of continuous feedback to stakeholders plays a major role in continuous compliance. But yes, the point here is automation and automation is a key thing in DevOps and the automation scripts are also going to reside along with the application code in the pipeline. And what are you going to automate? Automate every process step. And uh, that way, in fact, you are accomplishing the whole concept of process as code as well. So some examples that I can give on which process steps are going to be codified. Uh, number one, the process step on committing to the source code repository. Um, number two, something which is very specific to security is um, setting the required permission for the users. Number three, perform the required security tests on time. And it could also be like marking a story complete, a security story complete when some specific constraints are satisfied. So here we learned the art of codifying security in the applications. Uh, now, just to sum up what we have seen in this slide, we have to codify the security principles, concepts, tools, the security requirements, the security process steps must be codified. And all this will have to be codified in different phases of the DevOps, right? And now I move on to the next slide. Now this is uh, the implementation of continuous compliance and this is an example of the implementation, a little lengthy one. So um, we will see how all these concepts would come into action. Good lot of examples over here with the use of tools and techniques. So let's put some time and attention here. Take a look at this particular um, figure over here we are getting to see how a business requirement is getting converted into a technical security requirement. 
This figure also has details about the directions and procedures identified for DevOps professionals to apply the right security controls. For our example scenario, I've taken a specific case from GDPR regulation, more specifically an article within GDPR that requires data validation on all internal and external user input. And uh, we all know what data validation is. It is a technique that allows the user to enter only the valid characters that are permissible by the application. Let me take you through the series of steps over here before we see the tooling part of it. At first, the business has a mandate to adhere to the data regulation, uh, the data protection. Secondly, the applicable regulations for the data protection are being identified. And uh, in the following step, you are saying basically how the GDPR regulation has been identified as an applicable regulation. And uh, this is where the security team finds out that the data validation requirement needs to be built into the product. And hence data validation controls are being recommended, which is finally, or which is the final step that you see over here as part of this entire flow. So the question is, how does this requirement get implemented in the DevOps lifecycle? And here we go. This data validation control can be achieved using a bunch of security techniques like whitelisting, blacklisting, and encoding your output. Now, when we want to implement them in the DevOps process, these techniques are implemented as individual jobs. Job one, job two, and job three, you can see them in the top left corner. Now, the jobs are captured and codified as technical security requirements. This happens in the initial planning phase of the DevOps. There are tools that generate these technical security requirements based on the business mandate. I have mentioned a couple of these tools over here, SD Elements is one and Security Rat is one more. Now, as you go into the next phases, the build, the development and testing phases, you will see that there are a lot of security tools that implement the same requirement specific to that particular phase. What I mean is that at the development phase, there are libraries used for implementing data validation. And there are SaaS tools that are used as part of the build process. And DAS tools in the testing phases to test if the logic is implemented correctly. The point to note here is that these tools are automated in the pipeline and the outcome of the status, that is the results given by these tools are communicated to the stakeholders immediately. Now that's exactly how the automation is achieved in DevOps and the continuous feedback is also given to the stakeholders to see if they are in adherence to the compl uh, compliance or security or not. So all these security tools at every phase will help in confirming whether data validation controls are being adhered to Thereby, we will get to know whether the mandatory regulations or compliance is being followed or not. Basically, we are seeing how compliance has been implemented continuously throughout the DevOps pipeline. And importantly, automated through the use of security tools like your SaaS, DAS, and the use of Git and everything. So automation of security tools and adhering to continuous compliance are the two uh, takeaways from this example. Of course, when we talk about the pipeline, we can clearly notice there are other tools that are involved in the pipeline. It's just not about the security tools, but we have Git as the code repo, Jira as the issue tracker, and many other libraries and uh, framework that are used based on the language of implementation. Um, of course, there are some kind of pen testing suites. There is a cloud platform uh, where the deployment happens. And of course, if the virtualization path is taken, then we have to think about containers and Kubernetes and the use of corresponding security scanners for these containers. So this might look like a lot, but at the same time, this is just a snapshot of what happens in a typical DevOps or a DevSecOps process. And if you are a DevSecOps practitioner, you know that there are so many tools involved in real time, and this is just a sample, a very high level picture. But what you are seeing is that security is being practiced continuously and how compliance is being adhered to. Keep in mind, this is just the tooling part of the DevSecOps. There are process elements, cultural aspects, and all of these have a huge role to play. Okay. Now, accomplishing objectives, how to organize the security teams. Remember, this was the second um, objective that we identified. Before even talking about the how part of organizing the security teams, we should know why organizing the teams are important and uh, how this could help in accomplishing continuous compliance. 
we learned that there are very many tools and platforms coming into action. In the previous slide, we saw that there are so many process elements as well. And of course, a lot of teams are involved in carrying out the respective tasks and the DevOps process. Now, there are two questions that emerge. One, how to identify the security professionals that are going to be involved in the strategic side of the DevOps process and the security professionals and teams that are going to get involved in the execution side of the DevOps process. Number two, what are the roles, responsibilities, and what is that they are accountable uh, for? Which means how do they contribute to the continuous compliance process in the DevOps program? To answer these questions, we, we got to first define the concept of security champions. The security champions are the ones who empower and enable all members of the security practice to learn, adopt, and make sure all the security rules are being followed throughout the engagement. Of course, they make critical decisions about security risks and uh, communicate effectively to the organization management to improve the overall security posture. So the security champion plays and takes up both strategic as well as the execution side of the DevSecOps work. So from that perspective, we have identified two sets of security champions, the white teamers and the purple teamers. Let us see this in detail, what their responsibilities are and how they contribute to the overall continuous compliance process. White teamers, who are they? Some of you security directors and product owners, and yes, they play a functional role in strategizing security events to foster better collaboration among all security teams, and that includes products uh, and business teams, the vendors and the partners in all strategic security related aspects and you get to see their team functions over here. Auditing the security posture of the whole product right from the inception stages to the product launch. Planning the complete process steps, working with different teams, establishing the standardized operating procedures. Coordinating among all the teams because there are so many players involved in the entire uh, DevOps program. Making the complaints and making sure the complaints needs are going to be satisfied. And finally, taking accountability, well, that's a pure leadership quality and that helps in the DevOps journey in many ways. Purple teamers, who are they? Many of the consultants, the DevOps engineers, especially the people working in the, you know, the DevSecOps capability. As you could see here, they play a technical role. They act as bridge builders, primarily between the defensive teams and the offensive teams, which could be even the internal and um, external um, to the organization. And here you get to see their team functions or their responsibilities. Due diligence by performing the right security activities throughout the entire DevOps lifecycle of the product. Defining the security validation strategy based on the type of product development. Planning the security methodology, which is a key part of the DevSecOps program. Cost benefit trade-off for the defenses plan. For example, a defense mechanism plan might improve the integrity, but not the performance. So a balanced decision need to be taken. Now, how are these security champions going to accomplish or help achieve this continuous compliance? And there you go. So all these teams that you see here are very specific to a strategic role. A white teamer playing the role of a security champion brings a lot of value to the security program, especially the collaboration with different teams, knowledge management of repositories and resources that are involved. And by practicing continuous management, Items like tracking the budget, resource requirements, um, the resource requirements of the security teams, all these items are going to be taken care of. And when it comes to purple teamers, the benefits that you see are more aligned at an executional level. Performing continuous monitoring, there is a constant monitoring of threats throughout the product development lifecycle. And when it comes to continuous reviews, there is a lot of work that could be security design reviews, security code reviews, security configuration reviews. The purple teamer needs to organize all these activities. And we also see here the champion's role in, uh, champion's role is going to be continuous throughout the life cycle in securing the product. And of course, we get to see that both security champions, the purple teamers and the white teamers, complementing each other to build the continuous compliance in the product uh, from both the strategic perspective and the executional aspects. And here we are arriving at the fact that organizing the security teams would help us in a big way in accomplishing continuous compliance. And that could be made possible by having the roles, the responsibilities established for these security champions and identifying what they are accountable for.
and this they apply at every phase of the DevOps process. So as I said, it's not going to be a one-time thing or a one-person thing. It's going to be followed throughout the DevOps process um, and uh, it's going to be applicable for every uh, uh, team that is going to be involved in the DevOps process. All right, so that brings us to the final slide of this presentation. Some kind of best practices. I'll try to emphasize on a few of them. Um, continuous everything, so which is like continuous integration, continuous deployment, continuous training, continuous testing, and of course, continuous feedback and continuous learning. Follow all these regularly and as advised, and you will eventually follow continuous compliance. So, you know, the regular things in DevOps, as well as some of the specific items with regards to security. All right, threat model. Many of us know this, an activity that is loved by many taking the shift lift approach in product development. This is a heavy topic by itself, but briefly speaking, the focus here is on understanding many aspects, including the potential entry points, the adversarial goals, and how they are tied to the overall business. Yeah, monitor your security architecture, your applications or product does not exist alone. Keep in mind, there are many interdependencies and um, your application is just going to be one part of, you know, the overall um, architecture that I can say as part of the organization. So monitor every component of this architecture and monitoring it continuously is super important in achieving continuous compliance. And yes, secure coding, get trained in secure coding. I talked about continuous training, but yes, continuous training should help the developers in doing secure coding. Um, and in fact, like someone was talking about this, these days, anybody can build an application, but the question is how many of us are comfortable building a secure application? So there are a lot of resources for that. Um, so that is a very important one. Learning to speak the same language, the short answer is collaboration. You are not going to work in silos. You are going to work in close collaboration with the devs with QEA, the security folks with the business analyst, and it's going to be a one team effort. Test-driven security is the process of testing the compliance of the application of the product, including the complete networks and services offered by your application against the security policies. So, and of course, involve a security champion. I did actually talk about that briefly in my last slide. Um, there are just two categories of security champions, which I just said, but that's that process is completely flexible. It's all up to you based on how your organization is aligned, how the culture of the organization is, how your client organization is. So, but involving a security champion is very vital. Uh, establishing accountabilities for them is very important. And knowledge management is one more thing. Um, we did talk about that as part of the previous slide, and that's actually super important. All right, so that's about this, um, this presentation. And if you have any doubts, feel free to ping me, reach out to me, um, interested in research ready to take up any kind of a community project that benefits the security industry. And yeah, I am now open to questions and- Thank you so much, Arun. Thank you so much information that you shared so far. It actually was a good continuation of the, today's theme about the, there are some things behind the DevOps pipeline. There are some things behind the tooling. There are some things as a team, as a community, we have, we have to work together. Thank you for a good, great summary. We don't have enough time to ask more questions and get it, but I have one quick question that I would like to ask you. If you can get answered in a short time, like maybe one minute, that would be great. So in your uh, slide that you talk about the continuous compliances, I'm assuming that when we say the compliances, that goes back to what organization are mandated to follow up. Because there is a confusion between security and the compliance. They're not contradicting each other, that they're not kind of complementing. What do you see? What do you see that they end up like? Compliance is what the industry is dictated to do, but there's a security element on it, on it, right? Absolutely. So this is exactly where the security champion's role also comes in, in defining what this compliance is, what these regulations are, which aspect of the internal policies must be followed by us. So uh, the security champion plays, of course, a huge role in determining how we can handle certain things in the pipeline, how certain things can be handled outside of the pipeline. So uh, some of the mandatory regulations, some of the internal policies, all of this actually play a huge role. And it's not going to be a functional practice that's going to exist alone. 
The compliance will have to work in close collaboration with the security team, got to involve them, involve them at every stage of the complete DevOps process. Thank you so much, Arun. Thank you so much for your staying with us end of today. And we're gonna follow up with you for any question that we have, maybe you can go into the YouTube channel. So there might be a question that you can ask for. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, take care. As we are going to the end of the day and we did a quite a long journey today. I know DevSecOps is a journey for everyone. And I would like to quickly summarize what we discussed so far in 10 minutes, if I can. I know there's a lot of things to talk about it, but let's summarize what we discussed so far, what we learned in a 10 minutes that we can do. So let's summarize the day. So really we start with the welcoming a day. I mean, that's kind of like a, what DevSecOps community is excited today. We heard a lot of a sharing information, a lot of things that we work together to solve the security problems. A lot of things we heard about, let's share our DevOps practices, DevSecOps practice that we align your organization. Let's look at in detail what we really discuss, what we learn from each of the speaker that we learned today. So we start with a day and with the Christopher and he was talking about using the more proactive concept instead of being a, a reactive. We always try to catch up something end of the day. We are looking for, oh, something happened in our application, something happened in our environment. Can we really do something to fix it or work around it? You know, how can we get together? How can we work environment? So Christopher gave a lot of good tips, learning from a thread hunter perspective, what is really happening in our application context? How can we automatically analyze this content and thread and fit into the, our application development lifecycle. It's really, really important to understand what things we are seeing out there, what is relevant to us, so we can really change our application context with respect to security. As we are moving the second speaker, and second speaker was talking about, let's implement a policy. I know we did a great job on the DevOps, but the policy is really important to make it more reality in DevSecOps perspective. Policies are, you know, what things we have to compliance on our organizations, what we have to do for documentation, automation, and then versioning perspective. There is a principles behind the DevOps. There is a principles behind DevSecOps, which we have to do the more policy organization, like we have to follow up. We cannot make something as arbitrarily. Agile doesn't mean write a random code, or DevOps doesn't mean we're gonna stop the software practices at all. There's a policy behind it. So we have to follow up the policies, example, like such as using open source as an example, such as we are following the guidelines in the continuous integration perspective as well. When we go to the next one about the secret management, it's really, really important topic as well. I know we are building a lot of deployment practices with a lot of deployment perspective at the secure deployment, but we often ignore the very important elements. How we make sure that we are using the right key management. How are we going to store this key management? There are a lot of vulnerabilities happening in the industry that we would like to use as ready deployment practices, as ready using Ansible playbooks or using some other uh, uh, deployment practices. If you know, if you don't know how to manage the secret, it's going to get more complicated even end of the road. So better to manage our keys, better to manage our secrets in that tools we are using it or infrastructure that we are using it. So we can develop a secure application at the end as deploying the component into the production environment. As he coded, life is simple, but we insist to make it on complicated because we never look at that at the design level, how we do the secret management. It's simple, but we don't often ignore the simplicity. We are making more complexity when something happens end of the day that we learn from the uh, Jonathan's talk. And we will go into the a service mesh, mesh, mesh concept. And instead of having a service mesh, like let's get a, a great, great content of the service and why we use the service mesh technology instead of having a mess in a service, like in how we handle the security, how we're going to handle the control plane, how we're going to handle, handle the communication with each of the services. It's a really important topic as well, since we are growing an application complexity, Application complexity will have a lot of services in it. And how are we going to trust the services each other? Who's going to handle authentication pieces of the services, like API or microservices or any type of services that we may have? How are we going to assure that the life cycle of each of the services with respect to security? It's a great concept using a service mesh as a technical backend so we can secure uh, our services 
we can secure the deployment, we can secure our practices inside the service mesh that we are implementing. Can be Istio, can be some other tools as well, which is really helping us build up a great product, great services, has handled the security and control and monitoring perspective end of the day. And the next speaker was talking about the innovation approach for the security perspective. It's more about the thing, product level perspective. Like we have to really think about security as in the higher level of product security. Now actually there's a good segue and OWASP top 10 that just released the draft version of the top 10 vulnerabilities. Now the security design became a number uh, in one of the top 10 vulnerabilities, I think number three, as we have to address the security design at the beginning, it's becoming a vulnerability at that. There was a great example, Frank, he shared about, let's think about the security as we are designing at the beginning. As we are designing at the beginning, such as compliances, and such as we are looking for them about the uh, a product security requirements at the beginning, it's very difficult at the end. As last word he said, let's look at in the triangle, let's look at the what is easy and secure things we can get in our environment so we can make it at the, at the beginning, which is kind of an iron triangle for a security perspective. Look at the easy one and so we can secure an environment. That's easy way to get it secured in our practice design. Something we go to so much complicated, maybe it takes so much time, but still think about the easy low hanging fruits, get it done, make it secure component as overall. When we get into the afternoon session, there was a great keynote that delivered from Tanya and she really opened up a lot of mindset thinking, there are something behind the DevSecOps. It's more than the tool perspective. It's not just the pipelines. Yes, you can set up the pipeline. It's maybe a challenging for your organization, but you have to think about beyond the pipeline. What beyond the pipeline means? Learning elements. With the people are building knowledge. Let's use other application security practices so we can secure application by addressing the something outside the pipeline, learning, having incident response, and building about inventory, and learning about how can we build up some other parallel security testing as we can go faster while we are delivering the capabilities that we would like to do. And, and she gave a lot of good tips about it, using the test cases, test scenarios, maybe using a chaos engineering, maybe using other test scenarios. Build up something that you are doing application security as common principles outside your pipeline. Yes, pipeline will help us to deliver it as the end-to-end -end tool, but really think about what are the requirements are, how can we get a feedback mechanisms, how can we train our developers to write a security code, how can we train our security stakeholders, every stakeholders, think about the security mindset, which is outside the, just the pipeline perspective. Then we went into the metrics pieces as Tanya laid out in the afternoon keynote, metrics is important to verify how we are doing well. Then Suresh shared a lot of good information. Metric is a key point for DevSecOps that we can really see how we are doing well, how much we are doing the security, where we are in terms of security findings. So we have a right mitigation strategies. Like how, well, how long does it take to patch any vulnerabilities? It takes a day. It takes a month, it takes an hour. So we can see how we are doing well in our pipeline, what things is really work, not working, maybe a tooling problem, maybe some sort of a, a training issues, maybe some other architecture issues. See that we can learn from our data, look at the how things are doing well, out their business impact, we can improve our practices, we can improve our process as well as Suresh laid out. When we get to the last talk of the day, and Arun talk about the compliance perspective. It's a really important thing about the compliance is I don't have a visual graphics. I just took the one screenshot from his slide. Let's implement the compliances, continuous compliances as part of our DevOps environment. Like really tying into the compliance requirement into our business requirements as early at the beginning that we have to comply what the organization compliances are or HIPAA or GDPR that she gave an example about the GDPR article 25, article 78, that is really requiring have a data segregation example. How can we include this type of compliance in our organization that we are building? Requiring from the planning, then we put into the planning, we can do the testing, then we can deploy, we can make sure that we are delivering a compliance solution at the end of the day, which is a, everybody's involvement with the security perspective. So these are things we discuss as the throughout the day. And really, I would like to thank each of the speakers, Tanya, and she joined us from the, the Hex Purple organization. And 
And then also I would like to thank other speakers, Suresh, Jonathan, and Marutman, and Frank, Christopher, Aaron, and Rob as the, our speakers. And thank you for all of you participating our uh, day today. And we learn a lot from you. And I'm sure that all your, our participants and audience learn as well. And also I would like to thank our moderators, Jeff and David. And also I would like to thank our SEI backend uh, media team. They did a really great job so far and staying late and also helping us to deliver a great content of the product. That said, and we have a lot of DevSecOps that is coming up in 21. We haven't finished up yet. I know a lot of things to learn. Every time when I deliver a DevSecOps days, and I always learn something from our audience. I took a lot of screenshots. I am sure same thing for you as well. It's an opportunity to learn more from other thinking, other way of implementing security, other way of using your tools maybe, or some learning that we can increase our knowledge end of the day. That said, and also I would like to remind each of you, there is an all day DevOps conference coming up October 28. If you're gonna get more involved in the community and hearing about more than 180 speakers, there's an opportunity. So you can learn more and increase your knowledge. You will find something as some very solution for your organization. It's 100% guaranteed. I saw a lot of example taking advantage of this organization that we can learn together. On top of that, as an SEI, we have been holding a webcast, blog post, or the webinars. Please follow us through the, our URL and from SEI website for any information that you will get it from DevSecOps or DevOps or other type of information you can get from SA as well. And lastly, and I would like to thank our sponsor as the Purple, we hack Purple and Sonatype as this Carnegie Mellon University SCI. And this is a community effort. And I would like to thank each of the sponsors make this as real and make this as, as the community event. And thank you, looking for you to have another event altogether. That said, if you have any questions, please reach out to me either LinkedIn or the email, and happy to continue our DevSecOps discussions. Not gonna stop here, it's a journey. There is no end goal. Always we have, can do the better. We can learn from our mistakes. And I would like to thank each of you as the participating for a long day today and hoping to see you next event. Thank you.